I'm an outlaw. Banang a nang nang, quick on the draw. Well, here we are. I should probably be more professional. Hi, I'm Caleb Jones, otherwise known as Black Dragon, and today I'm gonna do my first AMA IRL. I'm so old. So I have a bunch of questions in front of me on my little lappy toppy, and uh, we gathered them all from the blogs, email, social media, mostly Instagram, um, all over the place, YouTube, and I'm gonna answer all of them. And this is gonna be a long fucking video, or we may chop it up. I don't know how my staff wants to do it. I'm gonna let them decide, but um, I've never done a video this long. So I'm sure a lot of things are gonna get fucked up because with my equipment here, I mean, the, <laughs> the microphone could run out of battery. Uh, I could fill the SD card, uh, whatever. All kinds of things might go wrong and uh, I don't care because I'm not gonna be dependent. See how that works? So let me cover the system first. Um, per my usual rule, and I do this for legal reasons, I will answer anything you ask me with the exception of one or two things. I cannot, um, how are we doing on the camera? We're good? Yeah, we're good. I cannot answer uh, specific questions about my finances. Caleb, how much money do you make exactly? Caleb, where exactly are you invested? Caleb, what is your exact net worth? I can't answer those questions. Um, things like that. So if there are any questions like that, uh, I'll have to skip them. Um, anything that I'm legally barred from answering. Uh, specific details. I mean, I can give you some details on my woman life. I have. I'm pretty, pretty open about that. But uh, specific, you know what I mean. Real specific stuff that could get me in legal trouble, I can't answer. But I'll answer anything else. Um, the questions that we received here that uh, were coaching questions, as I said, I will not answer coaching questions. So if you gave me a question that said, hey, my MLTR, da da da, or hey, I just broke up with my girlfriend, or hey, there's this one girl who, we remove those. This is not a coaching session. This is an AMA. If you want a coaching session, go to joinsmic.com. I do this twice a month there where I actually answer coaching questions. If you, um, let's see what else here. Oh, if you submitted questions that were like a giant paragraph this long or like multiple paragraphs. So Caleb, here's some background. And there's all this fucking, this wall of text. We remove those. And again, usually those were coaching questions. Keep your questions brief and to the point. Uh, let's see, we have removed all the names so you will be anonymous. We will not attach in any names these questions. I have seen, so here's what I wanted to do for this video. I, I wanna keep this video pretty raw without a lot of edits, if I can, to make it look like it's a live stream, even though it's not. And so um, I have seen about, let's see, maybe a third of these questions. So two thirds of these questions I have not seen because I wanna give you kind of a more extemporaneous answer. Again, duplicating this as if it was a live stream. So we'll see how I do. Um, what else should I say about this before I get started? I guess that's it. I can't think of anything else. I got my water over here. Is my phone on silent? Hang on a second. Make sure FBs don't text me during this. There, okay, we're good. All right, cool, man. And the order is all mixed up. So we didn't, we don't have like blog questions, then email questions, and I think we mixed them all up just to make them, just to make it more organic. So here we go. <clears throat> Let's see, can I read this shit? Hang on a moment. Still good. I'm all nervous about the technology going wrong here. So hang on. We're good, we're good, we're la la la. We got voice. All right, cool. I'm a 21 year old college student, and I'm graduating now with minimal debt, despite that college was a big mistake. You're correct. College was a mistake. I am planning on working for international school soon, not taking English like a bum backpacker. What's wrong with that? But a real licensed teaching job. I would be in Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, making 35 to 55 k. I could start my Alpha 2.0 business then. I know you said the answer, I know you said a job isn't the answer long term, but should I follow through on this if it gets me out of the collapsing shithole USA fast? Yes. Are you fucking kidding? Vietnam and Cambodia, you're in the best place in the world. You're in the best region in the world. At Southeast Asia, as I've said many times, is the only region in the entire world that will be on the upswing over the next 25 years. You're the only region, not the only country, but the only region. So that is the best place in the world to be. You're good to go. Vietnam, hell yeah. Cambodia, even better if you can rough it. Thailand is okay. Thailand's not bad. Uh, Vietnam and Cambodia are better in terms of long-term growth. So no, hell, you're, you're good to go, dude. What are your biggest regrets if you have them in life? And what would you have done differently if you could go back in time? If you don't have any regrets, what about your largest failures in starting a business that you have learned from and or made you a stronger person? So I, I don't have regrets. Uh, there are mistakes that I made in my past. Those are different than regrets. For example, obviously I should not have gotten married when I was 25 years old. 
certainly traditionally monogamously married. Um, but is that a regret? I mean, no, I, I divorced her and I fixed it. Uh, I'm good to go. I'm more than recovered from that problem. So it's not really a regret. It's just a mistake that I made. Uh, the only regret that I can think of that I would consider a regret is that I didn't, although I don't care about this now, I didn't travel in my early 20s. Uh, in my early 20s, I was thinking about going to Japan for several years because back in the early 90s, that was the cool place to go. And I didn't do that, and I should have, and I regretted that for a while, but I, I travel all over the world all the time. So again, I don't really care. So I don't really have regrets of that sense. Of that sense. Is that correct English? I don't know. I told you this to be wrong. If you don't have any regrets, what about your largest failures in starting a business? So dude, I've failed in business a billion times. I have failed and failed and failed and failed. I have done just about everything wrong in business you can possibly do. I have had multiple failures. I can't think of any one titanic failure. I've had so many little ones and I've learned from all of them. Um, I remember once years ago, uh, this is one that just comes out of my head. Um, I did a direct mail campaign, like 3000 letters. So this was thousands of dollars. No, no, it was $3,000, cost $3,000, which for me was a lot of money back then. That was a lot of fucking money. And uh, it was marketing a live seminar in Seattle, I think. It's a long time ago. And I got, I sold two tickets. And I felt so bad. I'm like, oh my God, I lost $3,000. Oh my God. But I learned from that mailing. I learned when you do direct mail, you don't have the mailing house use a dot matrix printer to print the addresses on the front with a bunch of barcodes and shit because it looks like junk mail. So most of the people threw that away. So I learned you have to ink the addresses on direct mail directly on the envelopes and have it not, and use a laser printer or even better have it like handwriting that gets you a much higher response. So that's just one example. I'd give you a billion examples. I have totally failed all over the place in business. I have not failed in investing. I have not failed in my investing life. I've never lost money in a given 12 month period or a given calendar year in my portfolio because the, the objective of investing is to not lose money. So I haven't done that. I haven't fucked up on that, but I fucked up on business. Oh, oh, tons of shit, all kinds of stuff. Why are you so hard on Japan? I love Japan, Japan's great. I love going there and it's a fantastic place to visit. An alpha male Tupano who is location independent could live in Japan and have a good time. Why am I hard on Japan? Japan is, a failure on a civilizational level. What do I mean? Well, if you're an American like me, we freak the fuck out if the stock market drops by 300 points, right? Everyone freaks the fuck out. Well, imagine for you fellow Americans, imagine if our stock market peaked in 1989. Imagine it has never gone where it was in 1989. So what is that, 30 years? I mean, can you, can you even comprehend that? How horrible that would be? That's Japan. Nikkei peaked in 1989. The stock market has never been higher in Japan than it was in 1989, 30 years ago. And you might say, well, so what? Stock market doesn't mean shit. I agree. But here's the deal. We're talking about Japan. We're not talking about some lazy culture like the Greeks or some chaotic, crazy culture like the Italians or the Brazilians. We're talking about Japan. These are the smartest, hardest working, most innovative, creative people in the history of the world and their stock market peaked 30 years ago. Japan is a civilizational failure. It's very sad. This is on top of the fact that 31% of Japanese men under the age of 30 don't want to have sex. That's on top of what I just said. It's really sad. Japan is um, it's a bittersweet place to go. Now, it's a great place to go. Most beautiful women in the world, if you don't mind small boobs, which I do. But it's great. But it's, yeah, it, on the overall, it's a civilizational failure. In a few decades, there will be no Japan. It is the only nation in Asia that is collapsing like the West is. Do you consider silver a better investment than gold? Yes, I consider it a better investment because gold is not an investment. Gold is a hedge. You can use gold as an investment if you want. And in my portfolio, I have it both as a hedge. I have two, two buckets of gold. I have one as a hedge for my cash and one as an investment. Silver is a better investment. Yes, silver is a more speculative item than gold because it is a manufacturing metal, not a currency metal. But silver, dude, silver is at 25. It's a 25. I mean, most of my shit I bought in at what, uh, 14? Gold's at what now? What is gold at? Gold is at uh, 1900, last time I checked it, on the court of this video, so I think yesterday. 1900? Keep collapsing, America, keep going. I know you can do it. Daddy needs a new house. Oh my God. So yes, yeah, silver is awesome, buy silver. If you have no debt, 
Go ahead and, and you have emergency savings, then invest in silver. Other than that, no. Don't invest in anything unless you have zero debt and a lot of emergency savings, then you invest. So you younger guys who aren't there yet, don't worry about silver or Bitcoin or gold and that shit. You older guys, go ahead. Hi, Caleb, I want an exact script. Oh, here we go. I want an exact script between a woman and what you would say during a first date over text to build value and make her want you. I can't give you an exact script because every scenario is different. I can give you exact scripts for like openers on an online dating site because those are all the same. But I can't give an exact script for anything on a first date like that. Anything specific, da da da, da but nothing. Looking for power statements, power statements and detailed techniques. Not something I can answer here in a quick AMA. Um, next for me would to be breakdown techniques and technology to selling courses. So again, that is a very big question that I can't answer in a quick AMA like that. First, you need to build an audience. You need to build some kind of list because you have to market the course to someone. It's difficult to market a course to a cold audience, although you can and I'm doing that. But ideally, you want to build a list first. They need some kind of platform to base the courses on. The two best that I think are the best are uh, Teachable and Udemy. Both of them are good. I was using Teachable for a while until I outgrew it. Um, now I'm on Kartra, but I do not recommend Kartra unless you have a mature business. Where are you moving to and where are your confirmed five flags and why? I can't tell you that. Can't tell you that as I described the Caleb Jones blog. My attorneys won't let me. I'd love to tell you. I'm so excited. I would love to tell you. I can't tell you. I will tell you March of next year. So by March of 2021, I will be there and I will be settled. And then I can tell you. And I have a lot to say about it. And my other flags too. Um, I'll give you a hint. I guess it really isn't a hint. I have multiple flags all over the world for every region. So I have a North America flag, a South America flag, a Central Asia slash European flag, an Asian flag, and a, yeah, I have those four. I can't tell you what they are yet, but soon. What percentage of your FB slash side lays in the last year are sugar babies slash escorts? Okay, well, 0% are escorts. I don't have sex with hookers. That's really not my thing. I know a lot of you guys are into that, and that's fine. Just not my thing. I don't do hookers. Sugar babies, yeah. Um, so in the last year, do you mean calendar year 19... Let's see, not 19. God damn, I'm getting old. 2019 or the last 12 months? Uh, I'm going to assume you mean the last 12 months. So in the last 12 months... Let's see, what percentage were sugar babies of my FBs? 65%, two thirds, maybe 70%, maybe not more than 70. If you ask me this question next year in 2021, that will rise to 95% because that'll be a transitional year for me and I'm not gonna spend any time building up new FBs in foreign countries that I don't already have. Um, so I'm just going to go the sugar baby route. Now, if you ask me this again in 2022, it will back down from 95%. So it really depends on the year. So the last 12 months, I would say about two thirds, maybe 70%. So the majority, but not the vast majority. How does your daughter feel about your dating and sex advice business? Well, for those of you guys who have daughters, what do they think about what you do for a living? They don't give a fuck. So she really doesn't give a shit. To her, it's normal. I've been doing this for so long. She has read pieces of my blog, nothing lately, I don't think. Um, she just doesn't care. You know, kids don't give a shit what you do for a living. They really don't give a shit. Uh, is she non-monogamous? No, she is 22 and she has a monogamous boyfriend who is 31, 32, older guy. My daughter is a VYW, a type two VYW. She likes older men. So there you go. Let's see. How big, small is your dick? Ha ha, just kidding. I really don't care, but you said anything. I did. I'll tell you about that. My dick, sure, no problem. My dick is average. I have an average dick. It's not big. It's not small. You want to hear a funny story about my dick? Here's a funny story about my dick. So um, just thought of this as you asked the question. So uh, years ago, some of you know bits and pieces of this story. Years ago, I was dating an Asian woman, an Asian girl. She was very young, and we dated for several years, and she was 19 years old at the time. And when we first started having sex, she was very inexperienced. I was the second guy she had ever had sex with. The first guy she had sex with was a Filipino guy. So that's what she was used to, Filipino guy, right? So then she has sex with me, average dick, white guy. And she's like, oh my God, your dick is so huge. Oh my God, it's huge. Oh, your dick, you, you got to cut your dick in half. It's too long and too thick and oh my God. And she would be at work and she would roll her sleeve down and look at her own arm her bare arm, it would remind me of her of my dick. And she kept talking about how big my dick was. Oh, your dick is so huge, oh my God. So non-monogamy, right? So we dated for a few years, uh, not casually. 
She started fucking other guys, which is fine. I don't care. It wasn't super serious. She started hooking up with black guys. So she went through. So she, we started at 19. By the time she hit 21, she hit her horny, slutty phase, which a lot of younger women do. They have this phase. They go six to 12 months. And they just bang a bunch of dudes. And then they go, oh, my God, I'm a slut. I better stop doing that. So she went through that phase. So in the span of a few months, she hooked up with like, I don't remember the number, six, five black guys, black guys, black guys, right? So then she circles back around to me as they always do, 94%, and we're having sex. And in the middle of having sex, she goes, your dick is so small. <laughs> so it's all about context. It's all about what women are used to. I had the same size dick. I'm like, you know, the size of my dick has not changed. You're just used to black guys. Before you used to Filipino guys. That's how it works. So. <laughs> uh, I got a cool life, dude. My dating life as an Asian male is non-existent. That is your fault. Should I just hustle more on online dating or consider dating in other countries that do not have media bias? Okay. I just recorded a video about this. I don't know if that video will go up before this AMA or not. It has nothing to do with media bias. I know guys who are Asian who have, pl have easy don't have it easy, but they easily, within, within reason, have sex with hot white girls who live in the Western world. So the problem is not white girls. The problem is not media bias. The problem is your head, your brain. There's something wrong. Calm down. The answer is no. Make it work. Also, I have some interest in Paraguay and South America like you do. Cool. But the iffy healthcare and endemics like dengue and malaria freak me out. I'm, gonna, I'm about to tear your ass a new one. Get ready. The diseases and medical infrastructure there don't bother you? All right, 2% rule. Please Google Black Dragon blog, 2% rule, and read those articles. I think I've written two of them. If it has less than 2% chance of occurring, don't worry about it. Don't let it influence your behavior. What are the odds that you will get fucking malaria if you go to South America? I have been to South America numerous times. I'm setting up flags down there. I have never gotten sick. I know several Western men who live in South America. They live there. They live there. They've never gotten sick. You're being a maniac. You gotta calm down. 2% rule. Both of your questions, you're, you're off the edge of the emotional spectrum. You gotta take a deep breath, relax, 2% rule. Am I concerned about the medical infrastructure? I toured in Asuncion, Paraguay, a hospital. It looked fine. It was perfectly fine. No, I'm not concerned about that. What's your take on men having non-ejaculatory orgasms? This was discussed in great detail by David Data in the book, The Multi-Orgasmic Male. So I have not read that book, but I have read Way of the Superior Man by David Data, which I really like and I recommend. And he does touch on that toward the end. So I'm aware of what you're talking about. That's the thing where you, you come up your spine or some shit like that. So here's the deal. This woo-woo shit about, you know, non-ejaculatory orgasms and coming up your spine and semen retention. And I'm not saying that stuff is bullshit. It probably is. But I'm not saying it is. What I'm saying is that appeals to men who don't have really fantastic sex lives to begin with. Here's what I mean. My sex life on a scale from 1 to 10 is an 11. It's not only my wild, wildest fantasies. It is beyond. And I mean this literally. Beyond my wildest fantasies, including right now. My typical week is beyond my wildest fantasies. If I were to show myself from 20 years ago, let's see, 20 years ago, I was 28. I'm 48 now. Right. If I had shown my 28 year old self pictures and video and descriptions and scenarios of my typical week of the women I was with, he wouldn't believe me. So if you come to me and say, Caleb, you could do non-ejaculatory orgasms and come up your spine. Caleb, you could do semen retention for a month and not come for a month and, and it'll be 5% better. That doesn't really appeal to me because I'm good. I'm good to go. There's no reason for me to bust my ass to make my sex life two, three, four, five percent 5% better. Now, you take the typical beta male guy who has sex, the typical beta male who has sex, what does his sex life look like? On a scale of one to 10, what is that? About a five? He's having sex with a woman who's probably a four or five infrequently. So you go to him and talk about non-ejaculatory orgasms. He's probably very interested. Fine, but that really doesn't appeal to me and it never really has. And it's just because of the quality of my current sex life. I just don't see the reason to go into this woo-woo shit. And again, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm going to make comments. Well, Caleb, that's not true. If you do some research, but fine. I'll, I'll, let's say that it is totally possible to come without ejaculating or to have a clear head if you don't have orgasm for 45 days. Fine. Let's say that's true. I have no need for it. Hey, Caleb, big fan. I listen to you every day. 
Cool. I'm in an OLTR marriage, wife with a few FBs on the side. Good. You have changed my life. Cool. I hope you're over 30. Excuse me, over 35. Don't get married till you're over 35. I'm a full-time musician here in Australia, which is, in my opinion, a great career choice for the alpha 2.0 lifestyle I live. As long as you're making enough money, sure. Do you have any musical ability? Do you play any musical instruments at all? So uh, I have some musical ability. I used to play guitar. I don't anymore. I don't play anything anymore. I, I'm too busy. But I used to play electric guitar at a Fender Squire Stratocaster. That was awesome. And then I also used to play um, classical guitar with the nylon strings where you actually strum. You don't use a pick. So what's crazy about that, When I was this is when I was a kid. I was probably um, high school, or early 20s. Is that right? Yeah. What's crazy about that is when you play nylon guitar, you may already know this if you're a musician, it's not the metal strings, it's the nylon strings, so you don't use a pick, so you have to strum with your fingers, right? So that means you have to grow your fingernails out on your right hand, and you have to have nub fingernails on your left so you can play the keys. So people ask, why do you have grown fingernails on one hand and, and nubs on the other? Yeah, that's, I play guitar. So right now, no, I don't play any musical instruments. I don't have a really strong need or passion to do that. If I were to do anything musical, I'll be honest with you, I would rather sing than play a musical instrument. Matter of fact, on one of my for fun to-do lists is to hire a, uh, a singing coach and just sing some songs. I'd rather do that than play an instrument. Let me check my camera here. Still, go still going? Cool. Okay. These cameras have a god... This is a good camera I'm using, but it has a goddamn limit of 20 minutes because of government regulations. So I've hacked it so it now can record as long as you want. Well, I guess we'll find out. If a woman brings up that she is non-monogamous, do you adjust your dating model and go right to the queen of the hill phase, or would you do something completely different? Yes. So for those of you who don't know what he's talking about, there are four phases you go to when you start dating a new normal woman and bring her into a non-monogamous framework. The first one is the EFA phase. The next one is the implicit phase. The next one is the verbalization point where you give her the talk. And the final one for MLTRs is called queen of the hill, where she accepts you're having sex with other women, but she wants to be your favorite. So you are correct is she says to you, hey, I'm non-monogamous. I got other boyfriends or whatever the hell she says. Yes, you go right to the Queen of Hill face. There's no reason to bring her slowly into that world because she's already in that world. Now, here's one word of warning about these girls because I've run into two of these women. Not very many, but these women who already were non-monogamous before they met me. It's very rare, but it happens. Um, for most women, non-monogamy is not a lifestyle. It is a phase that they go through so likely she is non-monogamous now but if she starts to really like you or she wants to marry you or have kids with you she's going to suddenly say okay we're not going to fuck other people anymore now we got to be monogamous because now we have to grow up and settle down and have children okay so you need to make it very clear to her the one piece of the talk you need to give her is that's great i'm non-monogamous too and i always will be and i will never change that's part of the talk it's part of both the talk and the OLTR talk. I've said this to numerous women, including Pig Firefly, who is now my wife. I will never, ever, ever, ever be monogamous. I will do this literally for the rest of my life, even if I get married, even if I settle down, even if I have kids. Doesn't fucking matter. I will be in my 70s, and I will still be having sex with other women, at least on a sporadic basis. Don't ever expect me to change my mind. I never will. And if that's a deal breaker, I completely understand. And you have to have the balls to say that or else you have one-itis. Let's see. Hi, Caleb. Hi. If you plan to start a blog that you hope could one day lead to becoming an AM 2.0 business, should you niche slash micro the blog before you start writing or keep it relatively general and see what posts attract higher audiences and then adapt to it and tailor to the market? Both. You start, you guess. Sometimes you have to guess your niche. Sometimes you have to guess. That's okay. Go ahead and start, get into the game, start the business. Get out there and start creating the content. And then once you've guessed your niche and you're writing to the guest niche, pay attention to what they say and modify the content based on what your audience wants, which is more or less what I did. It was a little more uh, careful than that, but that's more or less what I did. A lot of you guys have to get over this thing where you your business has to be perfect before you start your business. No, start your fucking business. 80% is done. I learned that from one of my mentors. 80% is done. If you wait until your business is perfect, you'll never make any fucking money. I make mistakes as, and as if you guys know, who followed me for a long time, I make all kinds of mistakes in my blogs, in my writing, in my business. I make them. I'm human. But I'm in the game and I'm making money. 
Don't be afraid to make mistakes. It's okay. What did I just say earlier about the prior question? All the failures that I've had in business. I failed a lot, but I make a lot of money now, so it's fine. That's the lesson. Have you ever hooked up with any female celebrities? Oh, shit. You seem to have hinted that a few times a few years back. Oh, shit. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to answer this question without uh, getting anybody in trouble, including me. Um, so it would start with what you define as a celebrity. So if I had sex with any like A-list celebrities, like household name celebrities like Scarlett Johansson or Nicki Minaj. No, of course not. Um, but that leaves a lot of room. So, for example, um, have I been with any women who they, the women, have been with A-list celebrity men? Yes. Absolutely yes. Multiple times, multiple women. So, yes, I've been with that caliber of women. Yes, certainly. Um, another thing I could say, I'm not saying this, but I could say this. Uh, I could say to you, hey, have you seen the movie Blank? And it would be a big movie that you've heard of or seen. And you'd say, well, yeah, sure. Or I could say, have you watched the TV show Blank? And, you know, it would be some TV show that is probably a big TV show. And you'd say, yeah. And I'd say, well, you know, you remember that movie, The Girl Who Da-da-da-da-da-da? And you'd say, well, yeah. And I would say, her. Or I would say, remember the girl in season two who da-da-da-da-da-da? And you go, yeah, yeah. And I'd say, her. Is that a celebrity? Probably not. Um, the other side to this is that I have been living this lifestyle now for 13 years. Let's see, 2007, yeah. So I've been doing this consistently, non-monogamous, scores of relationships. That's multiples of 20 in terms of relationships. Not women I've had sex with, but ongoing relationships. The sex number is bigger. But scores of relationships over a 13-year period with no monogamy and no dry spells. So that means, that's a lot of people over a prolonged period of time. So that means... There are women who, back in the olden days, back, you know, 10, 12, 11 years ago, were like 18, 19, 20 years old, who are now in their late 20s or even, you know, 30. Matter of fact, one of the first women I ever had sex with, who was 18, a long, long time ago, just had her 30th birthday, which made me feel really weird and very old for some reason. But anyway, so back then, a lot of these girls were just normal, hot girls who no one knew about. But in the years since then, maybe... And this is all alleged. So if there's any attorneys watching, this is all alleged. Maybe I'm just making this up. This is just my opinion. Maybe this happened, maybe this didn't. I'm not actually saying anything. But maybe, possibly, allegedly, some of these women came on to become reasonably well-known on the internet within their own circles. For example, um, maybe, possibly, one or two of these women came on uh, or ended up being famous Instagram models with big, giant followings. Maybe, possibly, maybe. Uh, maybe one of them went into politics and uh, actually got elected when no one thought she would because she's so young and has been on national news a few times because she's this young, hot elected official. Maybe, maybe, possibly, allegedly, possibly. Um, maybe one of them, um, um, no, nah, I can't go there. That's, that was too easy. So, you know, that's it. That's the best I could answer that question. Yeah. How useful is knowing your Myers-Briggs style? Could you give me a few examples on how it helped you? It is useful. Um, it's not as scientific as the Colby Index. So that is much more scientific than the Myers-Briggs. But the Myers-Briggs is helpful because a lot of reasons. The main reason it helped me is because it identifies the areas in which you are weak. And those are really important to know. And I didn't really fully understand those until I understood that I was an INTJ. That's my Myers-Briggs type. Not only am I an INTJ, I am an extreme version of an INTJ. So the very first time I had it tested, I actually did this professionally when I was 24, and it hasn't changed since then, not really. Um, <clears throat> uh, I read the list of the good, here are the good things about you. And I went, yeah, oh yeah, 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 cool, yeah. And then it says, here are the bad things about you. And I went, oh, yep, yep, oh fuck, yeah. I mean, like one of them was always thinks he's right. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, doesn't have a lot of empathy, can hurt people's feelings. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So it, it helps you identify the bad things about you, which I think is valuable. Could you give more details about, pro about process for getting women who left back into rotation? Well, again, this, I, that's a big topic. I will give you the quick summary, which you probably already know. You need to wait at least four months of no contact. Six months is better. A year is better. The longer, the better. You do not initiate contact. Checking the camera. We're good. 
You do not initiate contact, but you can respond to contact after four to six months. You hit her up. You don't use any game or anything. You just say, hey, how's it going? You have a quick conversation. You pitch a meet. If she says yes, you go invite her right to your house and have sex. Don't go on another date. You don't need to redate women. You've already had sex with at least twice. If she says no or she hems and haws, end the conversation and reset the timer for another four to six months and try again if you want. Personally, when I do this, I actually double the timer. So instead of six months, I wait another 12 months and then I try again, maybe. 94% return rate for women for me. For many reasons, but that's one of them. We're still good on the camera? Yeah, we're good. My question is about meaning versus income. I'll preface this by saying I've already listened to your happiness versus meaning podcast, and I agree with your points here. I consider myself a more altruistic guy. In the long run, I'd like to devote my life to helping others and solving the big problems the world faces. Okay? It's fine. However, I'm not making money right now, and I know I have to handle that first. Good for you! Thank God you're not one of these psychotic left-wingers whose life sucks, but they're going to spend all your time trying to save the world. Or God forbid some of these psychotic Trump supporters where you make $32,000 a year, you haven't had sex in eight months, and you're going to try to save America. Fix yourself first. Then if you want to save the world, do that as a second step, for Christ's sake. Good for you. I'm glad you made that distinction because a lot of people in the modern era do not. My question is, how can I reconcile these goals? Should I just work on getting my income up and worry about passion meaning later? Yes. Should I find a business that fulfills both? The two feel as, are, as though they're mutually exclusive right now. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Yes. Focus on getting your income up first. Ideally, it is better if you love what you do, but you don't have to love what you do. The rule of thumb is you can't hate what you do. So if you hate it, don't start a business in it. If you see that it can make good money and you're at least curious about it, that's okay. There's aspects of my companies that I don't like, but I do them anyway because they make a lot of money. And I like what I do, but if I did what I love to do, I would write uh, fantasy novels all day long and I wouldn't make any money. But I'd love it, but I wouldn't make any money. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write those later in life when I don't care about money anymore. See this works? So yes, get the money. You don't have to love it, but you can't hate it. Good question though. Good. Good for you. What industry would you go into if you were 23 years old in 2020 and why? Healthcare, 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 healthcare. Also, what types of roles would you apply for and why? I don't understand that question. I am currently working at a big insurance company. Would like to go into sales or become an insurance broker and eventually own my own business. Uh, hmm, fine, I guess. That's sales. Good. I'm just not sure if now is a good time to make a change with COVID-19. Ignore COVID-19. Proceed with your goals and your plans irrelevant of COVID-19. The only exception to that rule is if you are legally barred from those things. If it's legally impossible to do what you want to do because of COVID, obviously you can't do that. But on everything else, proceed. I am proceeding with literally everything I had planned for this year. I had a lot planned for this year with the exception of one little item. There's about uh, 17 items that I plan on doing this year. I'm proceeding with all of them as if COVID wasn't there with the exception of one because it's literally not possible because of COVID. And that I'll get around to when COVID calms down. So don't let COVID influence you like that. Proceed. Move boldly through life. Fuck COVID. June, the month of June for me, right in the middle of COVID, right? One of the best months I've ever had financially in my entire life. Not my investments, although those are doing great too. In my businesses. Not my best month ever, but one of my best. Um, Andrew Henderson, Nomad Capitalist, had his record-breaking best month ever, I think in April right in the middle of COVID. A lot of people are doing very well right now during COVID. Try to be one of them. How do you respond when girls accept non-monogamy? Doesn't work, but still say things like, I just want to get, to, I just want to know that I'm enough for someone, or I want to at least get monogamously married and at least try. A common prob problem I am noticing. Uh, that's not common, that is normal. That is what women do. Women are not rational when it comes to this stuff. Uh, you don't, in terms of responding, respond any way you want, but don't give a shit. It doesn't matter what women say. You only focus on what they do. Do you know the number of women I've had in long-term FB and MLTR relationships, totally non-monogamous, who said up front or at some point up front that they would never do non-monogamy, but they did it anyway? Ignore what women say and only pay attention to what they do when it comes to dating context. If you're working with women in business or a financial environment, that's different. But in a dating, sexual context, 
Don't listen to what women say. Just don't. Just watch what they do and base your actions on that. Um, I mean, you could answer these things. I want to know that I'm enough for someone. Well, if you were my wife, you are enough. But what happens when you start saying no to sex? What are my options at that point, sweetheart? I want to get monogamously married someday and at least try. Well, of course you want to try. If you get divorced, you get a bunch of free money. I would want that too if I was a girl. But if I get divorced, I get fucked in the ass. Uh, I am broke, unemployed, and can't find any job. What? Oh, I live in a country with high inflation. All right. I'll continue with your question. What do you think I'm going to tell you to do? If you live in a country that sucks, what do you think you should do? Do, 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 do. What do you think you should do? Do, 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 do. If you live in a country, do, 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 that sucks ass, do, 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 and it's fucking up your life. Do, 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 do. Move! Move out of the country. What do you think I'm doing? I live in a country that sucks. It's called the United States. I'm leaving. I got a few more months left. I'm out of here. I can't wait. Move. Now, that doesn't mean, when I say move out of the country, guys go, but I can't. But I didn't say move out of your country tomorrow morning. I didn't say move out of your country this weekend. Make a plan to move out of your country within 6 to 24 months. Any guy can do that, including men with no money. Any guy can do that. Ask Arnold Schwarzenegger. Any guy can do this. Don't make excuses. All right, continue on with your question. Is there an efficient way to start an Alpha Tupano business with almost no money? Yes, most Alpha Tupano businesses don't require any money. My Black Dragon Alpha Tupano company was started with, I think, $24. And that is a multi-six-figure income stream for me today. So yes, you don't need any money to start an Alpha Tupano business. If easier, what non-Alpha Tupano business could I generate from scratch to start rolling the wheel? No, don't. Start an Alpha Tupano business for zero money. You can do it. I have a lot of examples of this. Why do we see lower interest in Manosphere sites than several years ago? Shouldn't problems of today's men attract them to such sites? Good question. I need a water drink. Hang on a second. This is water. I just promise this is not vodka. My throat has been so dry. Probably because of allergies for August or whatever the fuck. Hang on. So, I don't know the definitive answer to that question. Um, but I have some theories. Um... Here's a few. Um, one is that the man, I've said this before, the most of the manosphere, not all the manosphere, but most of the manosphere is geared towards men who are angry and like to be angry and are looking for things to get angry about. And it, for a long time, the manosphere serviced that need. Now, a lot of guys, I think, are getting tired of this, even if they agree with it. So even if you are the biggest Donald Trump supporter in the world, you can only hear so many times, feminism is bad. Look at this stupid feminist. Look at these SJWs. They're fucking up our country. All these gay people. Donald Trump's going to save the world. You can only hear that so many times where you kind of start tuning out. And I thought I think a lot of men are tuning out now because they've had this for so long. There's only so much of this anger and negativity you can take for a lot of men. Matter of fact, I'm getting a lot of those customers. I'm getting a lot of guys who are from these more negative manosphere sites because they're just tired of it. They don't disagree with them. And I don't disagree with a lot of that stuff. But they're just tired of hearing about it all the time. They want to focus on something positive. That's one guess. Another guess is, and this is probably a few years ago, uh, it's not cool anymore. So especially in the pickup artist world. So if you go back to 2004, 2005, 2006, it was cool to be a pickup artist. If you were a pickup artist, the typical guy would go, ooh, that's kind of cool. Today, if you say you're a pickup artist, people think you're a loser, right? So the... Social stigma and the social opinion on these things, red pill, PUA, manosphere, has changed. It's not cool anymore. There was a time where this stuff was pretty cool. It's not really cool anymore. So the weaker men are going to kind of avoid that for that reason. They don't want to get ridiculed. Those are my two guesses. Um, I am betting that guys who are more immersed in this world, guys like Rolo, could probably give you a better answer than that. Because I'm really not, I don't spend a lot of time reading manosphere science. I don't have time. I got companies and I travel and, you know. But that's my guess. Do you think that a huge crisis and the collapse of the Western world might reset people's vision on money and women with their crazy Disney World fantasy? Oh, I see. Or are they going to remain the same, like hitting their face against a wall? So the collapse of the Western world is not going to change anything fundamental. Women are still going to behave in the ways they are fundamentally wired to behave. But 
Certain aspects of certain behaviors will change a little bit. For example, I was just talking to the SMIC guys about this. When economies drop, when economies get worse, the amount of divorces and breakups go down. Now, why is that? Well, who breaks up from who? Women usually break up from men, right? In boyfriend, girlfriend relationships and in divorces. So what happens is that um, when the economy gets worse, women get a little more nervous about going out on their own because it looks worse out there. So they tend to cling to their men a little more. So you'll see more of that as the economy continues to worsen. The divorce rate will probably go down the number of people moving out will probably go down at least a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit. So you'll see little changes like that. But beyond that, no, women are still going to behave like women. By the way, I didn't say monogamy will start working. So quote me correctly. I said the divorce rate and the breakup rate might go down a little bit. Women will still cheat and have sex behind their men's backs with guys like me. I would like a good answer. Oh, I don't have good answers. My answers are bad for how to avoid communication on the daily. Like these younger women sometimes only communicate with things like Snapchat or apps. Oh, believe me, I know. I'm there with you with the Snapchat stuff. God damn, especially lately. That indicate that you have been active and, and for how long, as well as if you have read their messages. Correct. This has been made easier for women to corner us into communicating too often. No, 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 no. No, no woman can corner you into doing shit. You decide what you do, not chicks. So there's no cornering, dude. That's up to you. Uh, at least this has happened to me with every higher end MLTR I get lately. So if they want you to communicate more often, that's fine, but you don't have to. You decide, not them. I'm getting contacted by current MLTR and the same was happening with my last MLTR and I am responding daily. Don't do that. I know this is wrong, but, uh, but obviously I fucked this up. Yes, you have. But you have talked about backing off slowly to every other day, good. And then less, but the issue is she will corner me by knowing I've been online and read a message which causes me to respond, no, rather than deal with any negativity or drama she might pose. Okay, so you need to enforce what the system that you are already aware of. You start weaning her off to every other day. If she sees that you read a message on Monday and you know you're not going to contact her till Tuesday, when you contact her on Tuesday, she gives you drama. What do you do? What do you do when a woman gives you drama? Soft next! Now, if you say, well, I don't want a soft next, you have one itis. Problem is you. So, yes. If Now, if she whines a little bit, what did you respond yesterday? I was busy. By the way, it, make that the truth. I was busy. What do you need? And I'm talking to you now. Now, that's fine. A little whining, complaining is okay. That's perfectly fine. It's not something you should fear. Alpha males get women who whine because alpha males do not do what they're told. If you want to get into a scenario where no woman ever complains about anything you do, be a beta male and live a shitty life. If you want to live a good life, women are going to complain every once in a while. That's okay. Complaining is okay. If she gives you drama, soft next. You're being a pussy about this. Stop being a pussy. I say that with love. <clears throat> you have mentioned, hang on, need more water. You have mentioned before, hang on. <clears throat> you have mentioned before, you don't do drugs of any kind, not even coffee or a glass of wine, correct. My question is simple. Why do you avoid drugs so completely? I can't understand how a small thing like a coffee could be bad for you or your long-term happiness. Okay. <clears throat> I've heard this before. <clears throat> Excuse me. Please raise your hand if you've had one cup of coffee and never drank coffee ever again. Please raise your hand if you have one cup of coffee per month. You know and I know that is not how coffee works. That is not how coffee, alcohol, smoking cigarettes, weed, generally speaking, there are exceptions, work. Coffee is something people do every morning. That is bad. That is a drug. I'm not going to go into details about this. I've been saying this for 20 years. Alex Becker just did a video about this, about how he quit coffee, and now he feels so great. I'm like, I've been screaming that for 25 years. Yes, coffee is a drug. Coffee is bad. It doesn't matter if everyone does it. It doesn't matter if it's societally appropriate. Same thing with alcohol. Um, now, um, let's see. So... Let me think a minute how to answer this correctly. Do I think that if I drank a cup of coffee, I would suddenly want it every day? Probably not. But if I did, life is difficult enough. Building your Alpha Tupano business, doing well with women is difficult enough when you're 100% sober and very healthy like I am. It's difficult enough. Why would I want to add yet another variable that I don't really need. So that's the next reason. 
I'm really happy. Most people who need to drink, one, when you have a glass of wine, people have said this before, like, hey, Caleb, don't you want to have a glass of wine, you know, after work, after a rough day? I don't have rough days. I don't have bad days. I can't think of the last time I had a bad day. I don't need wine. I'm good to go. I'm very happy. Now, Pink Firefly, my wife, as an example, she's a normal person. She has rough days sometimes, and she needs a glass of wine to calm down. I don't have rough days, therefore I don't need the wine. I don't need the weed. I don't have a bunch of anxiety or hyperactive shit where I got to bring myself down artificially with weed. I have plenty of energy in the morning. I don't need, uh, I don't need coffee. I drink, uh, I do, let's see, 12 ounces, 12 ounces of water with a little bit of salt in it. Plus I get eight hours of sleep every night. Plus I'm on TRT. I have the testosterone level of an 18 year old man. Ba -ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba. I exercise daily. Ba -ba -da -ba 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 -ba. I got plenty of energy as you can tell. I don't need coffee. So I don't need it. Why would I incur the risk to cause problems, especially if I don't need it? Make sense? And don't be disingenuous with this stuff because people don't want to have a glass of wine. Raise your hand if you have one glass of wine, you never have wine ever again. That's not how these things work. Coffee, cigarettes, weed. Yes, there are some people who will smoke weed once every six weeks. That's true. That does happen. That's true. Is that the norm? No. <clears throat> Recent thoughts on COVID-19 and its alleged resurgence in recent weeks and how the government is continuing to over-exaggerate this nothing burger of a super virus by forcing people by law, oh, we're going to have a problem. By law to wear a mask, because I know where you're coming from. I agree with you, but I know where you're coming from. By law to wear masks, even though they don't actually protect you from giving COVID-19. Okay. Lot to unpack there. So first of all, you are correct. As I said way back when this started, this will be a tiny, tiny fraction of the problem of what people were saying. If you go back to my blog, when I started talking about coronavirus back in March, there were guys saying, oh my God, millions of bodies piled up over the... Didn't happen. Oh my God, the healthcare system will get overwhelmed. Other than New York and a few places like that, didn't happen. Oh my God, I'm going to run out of ventilators. Didn't happen. None of these horror stories happened. I was right. So you're correct. Here's your problem. Guys who are... I was going to say right wing. There is no right wing in America anymore. The former right Trump supporters. And if you personally who asked this question did not vote for Trump, I apologize. But you sound like you're coming from that zone. Guys who voted for Trump, guys who support Trump, a blatant authoritarian, blatant Trump, the guy who wanted to shut down Comcast, the guy who wanted to shut down Twitter, the guy who wanted to shut down NBC, and was pissed off at his staff when they said he couldn't do it. The guy who has deployed federal troops to Portland, Oregon, 45 minutes from my house, completely, blatantly unconstitutional. The guy who just suggested that we should delay his election, which is exactly what people who hated him planned he was going to do. You vote for a blatant authoritarian and then turn right around and complain that the government is being authoritarian. If you are complaining that the government is being too authoritarian and you supported or continue to support Donald Trump, you need to look in the mirror and figure out who the fuck you are because you're a maniac. And I mean that literally, you're engaging in mania. You're just like those Bernie Sanders supporters who love Bernie Sanders and then turn around and say, I got to move out of California because taxes are too high. You're just like the libertarians who I mentioned a few weeks ago in my other videos who took the free government money. Ooh, yay, free money. I'm a libertarian. You guys are all maniacs. And so I have the right to complain about government being authoritarian because I didn't vote for Trump. I don't vote for authoritarians. If you're for big government, I don't vote for you. So I didn't vote for Trump and I didn't vote for Hillary. See this works? I'm consistent. I'm congruent. I'm actually rational. Now, speaking of rational, you just said that COVID-19 masks don't protect you from getting COVID. You are correct. The mask does not protect you from getting COVID, but what it does do, and this is scientifically proven all over the fucking place, is that it protects other people from getting it from you. So if you have a small enclosed area or at least a large enclosed indoor area like a shopping center or a grocery store and everyone is wearing masks, it does actually bring the incidence down overall. So it actually is a good thing to wear masks, as much as we hate it, to bring the disease down. Saying that masks don't make a difference, when you guys say that, when you former right guys say that, you sound just as maniacal as the left-wingers who have been saying for my entire life, 50 years almost, we're all going to die in 10 years because of the environment. You have to be rational. You have to acknowledge the facts and then state your opinions based on those facts. Now, if you say masks don't make a difference, this is stupid, we shouldn't wear them, you're a maniac. If instead 
You make a better argument, one I would agree with, where you say something like, um, having government shut down the entire economy and put 40% of restaurants out of business and destroy millions of people's lives only to make sure that a fraction of 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 1% of the population might die, the majority of whom are over the age of 75 at or above the average age of life expectancy where they would die anyway, that's overkill. We're overreacting. We're trying to kill a fly with a missile launcher. Now I can agree with that argument. I agree with that one. But when you guys say masks are stupid, we shouldn't wear them, you sound just as insane as the left. Rationality, consistency. Checking the camera here. Hang on. Okay, we're good. <clears throat> I remember you said in a comment once that if you were God, <gasps> you would have made men and women a little more rational. That's true. So my question is, how would Black Dragon the God, not a typo reference to rapper Charlemagne the God, update men and women? Dude, you're going to make me God. Uh, we got all kinds of work to do. Holy shit. Um, I don't know if I would necessarily need to update men and women. I could update the environment around them so that the way men and women work would be more congruent. Um, but sure, I would do things like um, things like this, where I would make it where STDs, gone. No more STDs. They're gone. You're go you can fuck up 47,000 people out of condom and never get an STD, number one. Number two, I would make it so men could smell a woman from 15 feet away and know with 100% accuracy if she was ovulating at that moment. Boom. So now you can have all the sex you want with no condoms. We don't have uh, unplanned pregnancies. We don't have STDs. We can do all kinds of fun stuff if you want to make me God. So there's two. Um, boy, that'd be a big topic if I was God. I don't think very many of you would be happy if I was God. I'm a libertarian and I'm not a Christian. A lot of you'd be pissed. It'd be fun though. How do you break off a date after your one after one hour per your model? Do you make up an excuse right before the date? Do you make up an excuse before the date which might lead to flaking on your date or more involved commitments, other life, blah, 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 or bring it up on the date which might lead to auto rejection, blah, 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 blah. How do you count? Okay, here's the bottom line for that. Here's the bottom line for that technique. You're following the system correctly. One hour first date, have sex the second date within two hours or three hours or so. So at the end of the first date, when it gets to 10 minutes to the end, when you're about 50 minutes in, and you don't have to be exact, don't like pull up a clock and say, I'm exactly 5 oh minutes, approximately 10 minutes away, you look at your watch. This is a Fitbit. So you look at your watch, you look at your phone, you say, I have to go in about 10, 15 minutes. Is that okay? And you ask it like that. You ask a question. So it's like, I got to be out of here. I got to go. Whoa. That'll make her scared to turn off. Instead, you say, I got to go in about 10, 15 minutes. Is that okay? And you say it just like that. 99% of the time, you're gonna, you're, she's going to say, oh, okay, sure. If you say, boy, I got to go. Let's get out of here. That's not how you end a date, okay? That's how you do it. I've had very good success using that technique. How would you set up the second date for a meeting at your home, i.e. typical text exchange you would have? Uh, so let me actually do this. I have to like do it on my phone to remember. So you're like, hey, how's it going, blah, blah, blah. So the first text to her would be, Hey, I saw a blah, blah, blah that reminded me of blah, 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 blah. Or, hey, how's it going? Real basic. Okay, that's how you start the conversation. So you're texting and you have this back and forth conversation. And you say, we should hang out again. I'm free on Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Or maybe Friday night at 6 p.m. And then see what she says. If she goes, no, move on. If she says, well, I can't, uh, I can't Thursday, but how about Saturday at noon? Cool, Saturday at noon, cool. And if she's under the age of 33, you say, we just, you can just come over to my place. We can hang out. If she's over the age of 33, you got to find another bar and do it again. That's basically it. Um, I am a 22-year-old Christian person. Ooh, this will be interesting. And I agree with most of your material. <gasps> You're going to hell, dude. What are you doing? <laughs> But Christian scripture says that a man should be loyal to one woman or become a monk. Incorrect. I don't think you've read the Old Testament. I was a Catholic during a child uh, during a child during my childhood. My mom was a Catholic nun. I have read most of the Bible, not all the Bible, because most of the Bible or a lot of the Bible is not readable. Uh, you need to look up uh, Solomon, Isaiah, uh, Esau, 
men fucking multiple women is rampant in the goddamn Bible. Now, if you say, but that's the Old Testament. Okay, where in the New Testament does it say, as of this page, ignore everything prior because the New Testament overrides everything in the Old Testament. Doesn't say that. It does talk about marriage. It does talk about that, but not about, you know, one woman and be a monk. No, that is someone from your goddamn church saying that. I still have sex, same guy. I still have sex with many MLTRs and love that lifestyle. Good. Good for you. Go to hell. Do you believe it is hypocritical as a Christian to do so, or what do you recommend to Christians to do when it comes down to women? So the bottom line is, does your Christianity contribute to your happiness or remove from your happiness? I know some Christians who are really happy people. Therefore, in, in an Alpha 2.0 context, it's fine, as long as, you're, long as you do those things. I also know a lot of Christians who are extremely angry people. You see these guys on the internet all the fucking time, sometimes they come on my blogs. These are very angry people, they spend their entire lives frowning at the entire world because we live in a left-wing world. So if that's the case, you should drop your Christianity so you can be happy. In terms of being hypocritical or not, that's a decision you need to make. If you are restricted from doing something that you really want to do that, and this is in my opinion, that doesn't hurt anyone and requires, doesn't require to lie to anyone. Those are the two parameters I use in terms of ethics and morality. Does it hurt anyone, including me? Do I have to lie? If the answer is no and no, I can do it as much as I want. And if that's the case, do, it, do whatever you want, but you have to make your own decision. If you feel super guilty about living an MLTR based lifestyle as a Christian, you're gonna have to make a change. Now, obviously you know what change I would tell you to make, Embrace Alpha 2.0 and leave Christianity. You can still go to church and be friends with your Christian friends. Uh, my wife is a Christian. Right? So you can do it. But it's a decision you have to make for yourself based on long-term happiness. Not based on what you think you should do. Not based on what your mom thinks, what you think your mom would say. Not based on what your pastor would say. No, as an Alpha male 2.0, you will be happier than all those people. And I speak from experience. You have mentioned before that you often talk about sex in the first date, but... But what specific things do you talk about? How graphic do you get? I get as graphic as I'm able to get calibrated based on her ASD levels, if I know them and sometimes I don't, and her age. So women over 33 have a much higher ASD and are much more prissy about this stuff on first dates, but younger women don't care. So I get as graphic as I can get. Now, sometimes as graphic as I can get is talking about sex in very general terms. I have had many first dates. By the end of the first date, I was talking about finger banging and orgasms and clitorises and all that stuff. Is that typical? No, but I go as far as I can get within those two parameters. And I don't push it hard. If I see her kind of getting nervous or uptight or uh, 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 don't push it, I back off and I don't talk about it. But I go as far as I can. Do you talk about sex with Asian girls that are brought up in Asia on the first date? Uh, are you fucking kidding? So the last time I was in China... Let's see, it was a year, not, see, not Hong Kong, but the last time I was in China, I hooked up with a Chinese girl who was about 22 years old, 22, 23. Um, she was in the same building as I was in with my Airbnb, so it was kind of almost like a day game thing, although she was already in the vicinity, so I don't know if you call it day game. But anyway, um, yes, in our first conversation, we were talking about sex. So this was a Chinese woman who grew up in China, was able to speak English, the answer is yes. You know what I learned from her, interestingly, interesting enough, I can't talk, interestingly enough, is that she was talking about how in China, more and more men are checking out of the sexual marketplace because, quote unquote, they are watching the Japanese cartoons. So all these Japanese porn uh, anime cartoons have now invaded China. So this herbivore of men in Japan is now being exported to China. Very interesting. China's going to have a problem soon because there aren't enough women. But maybe that problem won't be as big as we think because so many guys won't be having sex. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. More for us. So the answer is yes, I do. If you were a chick, who's the one guy you'd sleep with? Uh, pfft, shit, I don't know, man. Let me think a minute. One guy I'd sleep with. Well, the problem with that is I don't know, if I was a woman, I don't know what kind of, I don't know what I would be attracted to. I wrote two articles years ago at the Black Dragon blog about Black Dragonette, if I had been born a woman. Born a woman, but with my same brain and same, you know, uh, personality and objectives and things like that. Um, I have a feeling that if I was a woman with my same personality, uh, I would be one of those women who 
has a very low tolerance for men. You know those women who just kind of like roll their eyes at men? They're not bitches, but they're like, okay. I mean, I would have very little patience for all of men's one-itis and neediness and territoriality and just, ugh, and jealousy. Uh, yeah, it'd be a problem. So thank God I'm a guy. Holy shit. Um, who would I sleep with? I, I don't know. I can tell you the men who, when I was younger, I thought looked good and I wanted to emulate their looks. So... Alec Baldwin in the 90s, not Alec Baldwin today, but Alec Baldwin in the 1990s. You watch the movie like The Shadow, which is not that great of a movie, but he looked really good in that movie. I'm like, I remember watching that movie going, I want to look like that. Um, Antonio Banderas in the 90s, like in the Desperado movies. I remember thinking, man, I want to look like that. He looks really good. Not like I want to fuck that guy, but I wanted to look like him. Any tips you could give on fuck closing a woman? <laughs> fuck closing. Uh, I miss these pickup artist terms. On fuck closing a woman than the first time at her place, all my experience is fuck closing at my place. Well, that's 98% of my experience too. But due to current logistics, that is impossible. Oh, you live with family or something. Got it. Or you live with your girlfriend, you're being a bad little boy. Usually when I try to bang the first time, I make up an excuse to go to my apartment in order to give her, in order to give her plausible deniability. Okay, here's the problem. Most women do not live alone. I don't know if you've noticed, women don't like living alone. How many women do you know who live who are not old ladies? Let's exempt them. How many women do you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, who live totally alone, no children, no family, no roommates, no nothing, no sisters, no nothing? How many do you know? That's the problem with trying to hook up at women's places. Women always live with people. Now, if they don't live with someone, those are the logistics you determine on that first date through the questions you're asking her, if she lives alone or not, you should know by the end of the first date, and I do, whether or not what a woman's living situation is, if she lives with other people or not. Now, if she doesn't live with someone, just ask her. Just ask her and just don't push her hard, but ask. And she might say yes. The problem is, it's a very, very small percentage of women. Nothing much you can do about that. And women are not going to bring a new guy home to fuck them if they live with someone else. That is very, very, very rare. I don't even try. You can try. It's too much work. And I don't like working hard. In my dating life. In my business life, I love working hard. In my woman life, I don't want to work hard. I want to have sex and smile and be happy. Sexual tech... Oh, hang on a second. Hello, hello. Good. Sexual techniques for women... Re sexual techniques for... I can't read. Sexual techniques and woman retention for guys with small penises. The size of your penis is not relevant to how good you can make her feel during sex. So any guy of any dick size, it doesn't matter, if you want to retain these women, particularly in a non-monogamous scenario where they know you're hooking up with other women, you need to make them feel very, 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 very good. You need to make them orgasm every time you have sex. The exception would be those small percentage of women who can't orgasm because they're too young or they have mental baggage or what have you. And even with those women, you make them feel very, very, very good. A woman can orgasm one of four ways. Fucking her with your dick, which is very rare. Most women cannot do this. Some can. We love them, but they're very rare. Number two, your finger. Number three, your tongue. Number four, a vibrator. Pick one of these three and get good at it and start doing it. Irrelevant of your dick size. That's not relevant. I would give you the same advice if you had a monster cock. Same thing. I'll understand if you can't answer this in a single video, but how would you have fixed Game of Thrones? So if you go back, I did a video on Game of Thrones, like last year. If you look on my channel, just type in, do a search for GOT. The issue with Game of Thrones is a few of them. Number one, George R.R. R. Martin is a very good writer in terms of character, setting, and dialogue. Matter of fact, he may be the best writer of dialogue in the modern era. He is extro he's beyond genius with that. He doesn't know how to write a plot. He is not a plotter. He has no idea how to write a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. So Game of Thrones, that's why I stopped reading Game of Thrones at the second book, because I realized he had no idea where he was going with the plot, and I was right. So it becomes these, you know, thousands and thousands of pages of these really cool characters saying these really great things to each other, walking around with nothing going on. It sucks. This is why he has not written an ending to his final two books. It's been eight years. Why has he done that? Because he doesn't know how to write an ending. He doesn't want to. Problem number one. Problem number two. Benioff and Weiss, who ran that show, who were the showrunners for that show, were, they are not writers, they're editors. They're not writers. One of them wrote, um, helped write one of the, the horrible Wolverine movie. That's it. They're editors. 
so they can't write an ending either because they're not writers. So if you say you're gonna write the ending, guys, okay, they'll do it, but they'll do a terrible job because they're not writers. So Game of Thrones, in many respects, wasn't really fixable. It is what it is. It is wonderful characters, wonderful setting, amazing dialogue with a plot that is so stupid and doesn't make any sense. So if you need a good plot, and I do, you can't read Game of Thrones. I mean, you, you can, I guess, but you can appreciate the dialogue, but that's it. What resources besides your own would you recommend to help find good alpha, alpha male 2.0 business niches? There isn't any that I know of. I've been asked that question before. I wish I could give you a better answer. You just have to do your own research, starting with the niches that you're aware of. I, I wish there was more resources for you guys on this. I will try to get more resources for you guys on this because I know it's a big topic. If you only had, if you only had fifty thousand dollars and nothing else, what would you invest in right now? I would not invest at all. That would be my emergency savings. So step one is pay off. Oh, you're not mentioning if you have debt. So if you have debt, that's the first thing I would do. Pay off all your debt. Step one, pay off all your debt, all of it, all of it, all of it. Step two, you need to have six to 12 months of expenses in a cash savings mechanism somewhere. If that's cash in a safe, if that's a money market account, not a bank, please, one of those two. Then when you have those two things in place, then you invest. So 50 grand might be, you know, might be my six, seven, eight month savings account. And then I would start investing after that. I wouldn't invest anything using that 50 grand. You also want to hedge your, your currency with cash, excuse me, hedge your currency with gold. So out of that $50,000, I would probably take, uh, I would probably take uh, 20, not 25,000, 17, 18,000 of that and buy gold coins. And that would not be an investment. That would be an insurance policy on my cash in case the dollar collapsed, the gold would go up, which by the way is happening right now. Could you give a specific step-by-step -step guide to referral game, fucking the friends of your FBs and MLTRs? No, I cannot. In this brief AMA, you're going to have to buy the Ultimate Younger Woman Manual. I have an entire chapter on that with charts and graphs and techniques. Uh, the I'll give you the bottom line on it. Um, I still do that today. Matter of fact, I'm doing it right now. It's awesome. It works very well. But the women need to be under the age of 25 and lower ASD. Don't even bother if she's over 25. If you ask a 38-year-old woman to fuck her friend, she's going to slap you in the face. You'll, ne you'll never see her again. If you ask a 23-year-old girl to do that or an 18-year-old girl, she'll say, hey, okay. So start with that. <clears throat> Can you have a webinar with someone on YouTube as it's not something you're properly qualified to, on your, uh, to, qualify to do yourself on using only all natural methods to help permanently overcome ED, PIED, which is porn-induced ED, and or PE for guys badly afflicted with either of them or both of them. Um, maybe, sure. Discussing how to get rock hard erections and reducing the refractory period during sex through only using herbs, diet and nutrition only. No. As opposed to using pharma meds and drugs, drugs that should be totally avoided. I agree, I don't take drugs, I don't like drugs, I just talked about that, but there is no way, if you're over 40, Okay, if you're over 40, there is no way, if you have um, trouble getting hard, most likely the problem is here anyway. Rarely is the problem down here. It's usually here. There is no way you're going to do that just by taking herbs. I'm sorry, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Maybe if you're in your early 20s, maybe. Even then, I doubt it. You're going to have to fix what's upstairs first. That has nothing to do with taking herbs or drugs. And if you've completely fixed it and you have a legitimate problem with the plumbing down there, Herbs aren't going to do it. They may help a little bit, 10, 15%. But if you said rock hard erections, you ain't getting a rock hard erection by taking fucking cloves or whatever. Sorry. Now, discussion of what to do then, Viagra, Cialis, um, what's that thing where you do the needle and dick? I forget. You, you want to have that discussion, that's a different discussion. I agree. I don't like taking drugs. I don't think you should. But I'm being honest with you. You're not going to get a rock hard erection from herbs. You're not. In acknowledging guys with a public profile and a brand are restricted in what they can say about themselves. I just talked about my dick, dude. I'm not restricted. What do I say? <laughs> but I know what you mean. Yes, like finance and stuff. Plus, they're entitled to, having, entitled to having a private life and it's nobody's business anyway. What would you know and or have read about them? Who do you consider the best, preferably living alpha 2.0 role models for guys to follow as opposed to guys who have fucked things up like Arnold Schwarzenegger? Will Smith is fucking them up too. 
Uh, they don't have to be guys from entertainment, but they can be from politics, sports, business, etc. Okay, so here's the problem. There are a lot of guys who are celebrities, or, or at least minor celebrities, who were Alpha 2.0s before they fucked it up. Will Smith, I'm reasonably convinced, was a pretty decent Alpha 2.0 until he fucked it up. Um, Penn Gillette is an Alpha Male 2.0 until he didn't fuck it up until he signed the contract he signed to those Vegas shows. So he was locked in Vegas, so now he's location dependent. But other than that, he's an Alpha 2.0. But he was a total Alpha 2.0 before that. Open marriage and, you know, all that stuff. Um, Gene Simmons was the king god of extreme Alpha 2.0s before 2011 when he fucked it up and got one-itis and got monogamous. Okay, so there's a lot of former Alpha 2.0s I can name. Um, I can't really give you off the top of my head, I'm sure they're out there, real celebrity Alpha 2.0s. The other issue is, and we've seen, we've seen the rigmarole with Will Smith about this, guys with non-monogamous relationships don't like to advertise it because they're scared about what their wives will say or what their moms will say. There are guys in the manosphere, in the pickup artist world, who have very open marriages, and they lie to their audience and say that they're not open. Stupid, because they're scared about what their grandma will say or some shit. It's a, it's a big challenge. As I said this before, I am the only, with the exception of maybe the guy who wrote, um, what's his name? Um, I know him. What's his name? The guy who wrote Sex at Dawn. I forget his name. With maybe his one exception, I'm pretty sure I'm the only guy on the internet that actually has an audience of any reasonable size that blatantly tells the world that I'm married and I fuck other women. And I should not be the only one. It's ridiculous that I'm the only one. It's of advantage financially for me to be the only one. So, but it doesn't help you. How many women do you approximately need on your roster so you can have one FB year round without other methods to meet women? As I talk about in the Ultimate Open Relationships Manual, I have an entire, I have two chapters on that, how to determine that number. That number varies based on you. A number of, I can't give you a number because I don't know your scenario. It varies based on your sex drive, how often you travel internationally, um, uh, your need for, for variety, how good you are at maintaining women and retaining women, things like that, the age of the women you tend to like, all these factors. It's a complicated formula where you figure out your ideal number. Um, if you want a wild range, you're looking at, boy, at least 12, 13, 14 women at the bare minimum, but that's not going to be a lot for most guys. It won't be enough for most guys to maybe, oh, I don't know, um, 35. So let's say 10 to 35. I don't know where you are in that range. You're somewhere in that range. And every guy's different. Let's see. What is a reasonable expense for a single meetup with a sugar baby for guys who have beginner, intermediate, and advanced levels of game? Again, I can't give you a number because it depends on the city and the region and the country. So some places it's 300 bucks. Some places it's 600 bucks. It really depends. In terms of intermediate, advanced levels of game, if you have advanced levels of game, you can talk her down after you have sex with her twice. There's a whole sequence in that. If you read the Ultimate Younger Woman Manual, I talk about how to do that. Um, you can get them, you can start them at a certain point and get them down to as low as 150. But again, that depends on the city and the region. Every city and region is a little different. I wish I could give you these solid numbers. Don't pay more than blank. That's not how it works. I don't know where you live. I don't know what type of woman you like. I don't know what, what websites you're using. I need to know all these things to give you specific answers. If your own dad, Caleb, who is, if your own dad, Caleb, whose divorce is healthy, that's very good to know. Uh, he's reasonably healthy. He's in his 80s, so he has typical 80s old man problems, but he's healthy, yeah. I just went up and visited him. He moved um, about an hour north of my house. But when a guy gets really older, are there ways he can avoid becoming a groveling beta toward their female partner? Mm, you know, I've seen this with my own dad who turned 88 last week. It's both super depressing and heartbreaking as my stepmother, who looks after, her, after him, can often be a rather selfish bitch. In this case, he has a declining heart health and has... Mascular, mascular, macular. He can barely read since he's almost blind. Oh my God, he's almost blind and hasn't been able to drive since 2015. So he's lost all of his ability to be independent. So that's an extreme. If you can't see, you can't be an alpha male 2.0 because you're not, you don't have independence of action. That's just the reality. doesn't matter how old you are. So that's just the way it goes. In terms of getting older, yes, uh, it happened to my own dad. My dad was an alpha male 1.0. And today he is an extreme beta by his own admission. That's not an insult. We've talked about it before. 
And so, uh, yeah, that's, um, this is what happens when you're not paying attention to your mission, to your physical fitness, and to your testosterone. So if you never want that to happen, and I never want that to happen to me, my model for aging is Sylvester Stallone. He's in his late 70s, perfect, great. I'll be like him in my late 70s, great. Why? He paid attention to his mission, and he never lost sight of it. He pays attention, and men like him, he's not the only one, there are a lot of role models. Pay attention to your physical fitness as you get older, and pay attention to your testosterone levels. My testosterone will be at the level of an 18-year-old man for the rest of my life until I keel over. As men get over, their testosterone goes into the pit, and then sometimes they get so low, especially when they get in their 60s, 70s, 80s, they're almost, you, you tell them about TRT, and they're like, ah, it's not worth it, because they're just too far gone. Don't ever let yourself get that far gone. Don't ever do it. Alpha Male 2.0 is about long-term happiness, the rest of your life. The Alpha Male 2.0 model works from age 18 to age 79. Once you get past 79, I really can't speak to that because I really don't know. But I know guys in their 70s who are following these models and living a great life. Guys in their 70s. How much money does Pink Firefly contribute to the bills and the rent? So those are two different things. Bills and rent are two different things. I pay the entire rent. And I do that for two reasons. Number one, I don't want it, there to be any confusion as to legally whose house it is. If there's ever a problem, there will be no confusion. Kayla has been paying 100% of the rent and has had not made Pink Firefly pay him a rent fee. That's number one. Reason number two, the biggest reason is that there is a large disparity between what I make and what she makes. She makes decent money. She makes more than the average American. So, but she makes this, I make like this. So there's this huge disparity. So do I mind paying the rent? No, I don't fucking care. Now, if you had an OLTR wife where the disparity was small, you made this and she made this, well then fuck, man, she should be paying some of the rent. Hell yeah. Or she makes more, you make about the same, fucking yeah, bitch, pay the rent. You're paying 50% of the rent, dude, or something. Work out something. Uh, in terms of bills, she has her bills that she pays, I have my bills that I pay. And it's that simple. So um, irrelevant of what they are. For example, Pink Firefly likes to watch cable TV. I don't watch TV. TV's stupid. So she pays this fucking $120 a month Comcast bill so we can have a cable signal come into the house. Okay, I don't watch it. That's her bill. She pays it. What changed that you weren't able to talk about your income before and even made an article about it where now you openly say multiple six figures or half a million? Nothing's changed. I've never told you how much money I make. Half a million, I say around half a million. That's not how much money I make. That's around. Multiple six figures, that's not a specific number. I can't give you a specific number, and I never will give you a specific number. You know what's interesting is that um, in our last focus program meeting with the focus program guys, the Alpha Tupino focus program guys, uh, I think that was April? When was that? The last meeting, I told them how much money I make, to the dollar. I actually gave them the real number. That is the only time I've ever given out my income to a group of people like that. But they're in the focus program, so they can, they can know anything. Um, so nothing's really changed. I give general estimates. Maybe these estimates are low. Maybe I'm making this all up and they're high. Who knows? Who knows? The problem is I have to say something because I teach business advice. So I have to say something. I realize in my marketing, I have to say something. So I have to generalize. But nothing's changed. Caleb, you're a big proponent of TRT for guys age 40 and over. Yeah, I just said it. Correct. Matter of fact, I consider TRT a requirement for men over the age of 40 unless you are a genetic freak and your testosterone is 800 or above naturally. Some guys are like that, most are not. Uh, I can totally respect that, but for numerous reasons, I am not myself as it holds absolutely no appeal. If you're an open-minded guy, please interview someone like Xander Holt on your YouTube who espouses using only diet, nutrition, herbs to naturally boost testosterone. Here's the problem. I don't know who Xander Holt is. Here's the problem. I've said this before. Can you use natural methods to raise your testosterone? Absolutely, you can do that. The best article I've ever seen, and I recommend to others, if you Google artofmanliness.com, testosterone, big article there of a guy who tripled his testosterone. He got it from, let's see, 200 something to 700, purely naturally. Very good. So yes, you can. The problem is, we're talking about what is optimal. In my opinion, and I am not a doctor, this is not medical advice, this is just Caleb's opinion. In my opinion, using American measurements, your testosterone, your total testosterone, should be at least 800 for the rest of your life. 
Can you, if your testosterone is 300 or 400 and you're over 40, can you get your testosterone from three or 400 to 800 naturally and maintain that for the rest of your life in your 40s, your 50s, your 60s? You can have a natural testosterone level of 800 by eating steak and doing sprints and shit in your 60s? No, it's not possible other than rare exceptions, which I'm sure you could find. There are rare exceptions. There are rare genetic freaks who can do this. They're very lucky men. The vast majority of men watching this video are not gonna be able to maintain a T level of 800 plus, 100% naturally in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. You're going to have to go on TRT eventually. Now, you could argue with me that maybe 700 is a better number. Okay, can you maintain a, t a natural T level of 700 naturally in your 50s, your 60s, your 70s? impossible or very difficult, which means you're gonna to have to go on TRT. That's the problem. It's not that you're wrong, you're right. And you should do everything you can to boot your T levels naturally. But you are going to reach an age where it will not be possible to get to 800 without doing something, something exogenous. It's the way it goes. And you know, look, here's the other thing real quick. TRT is only our current solution. Medical technology is an IT technology, which means we have in exponential growth. In 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, there, no, there won't be TRT. There will be a much more safe and natural way to do this that they haven't invented yet. This is only the current scenario. So long-term, you don't have to worry about this. But right now, that's the deal, yeah. How do you avoid dominant women when you use online dating apps? We know that a date with a dominant woman is usually a waste of time. Incorrect, a date with a dominant woman is practice. Every first date you go on should be considered practice. I have had several first dates where within 10 minutes I know this is a no-go, she's a total bitch, or she's a total dominant, or she won't like me, or I don't like her, but I continue the date because I want the practice, or I wanted the practice, I don't need to practice anymore, but I wanted the practice, so it's practice. Number two, dominance, if you can pull it off and it's hard, make fantastic FBs, fantastic FBs, especially dominants who already have boyfriends, oh, they're great. So dominants are great as FBs. Do not date them past the FB level ever, but they're great as FBs. So it's not quite a waste of time. Um, avoid dominant women. The only way to do that when you're on the online dating phase is to pay attention to what she says. If you say, hey, let's go get a drink at this bar, and she goes, no, let's get dinner. Do you want to get dinner? I know a really good place to get dinner. That's a dominant, move on. <clears throat> Unless you want practice. But sometimes they don't do that. Sometimes I call them, in my books, I call them stealth dominance. They act like normal girls. And then they get, you get on the date, all of a sudden the dominant monster comes out. Happens. No way around that. So enjoy the practice. In your experience, what is the most effective method for tracking your goals, projects, and to-dos using E3D time management system, index cards, journals, software apps, <clears throat> or some combination of these? I purposely do not give that information. Excuse me, I purposely, hang on a minute, god damn it. This is what happens, you talk a lot. What time is it? Ooh. Is the camera still going? Cool. <clears throat> There's a reason I don't talk about that. The answer is whatever works best for you. So in all of my time management advice, I never, ever, ever talk about use this, use Trello. Use index cards, use Excel, use whatever you want. You can take all of my systems and most time management systems and plug them into anything you want. Some guys love using their phone for their time management system. Some guys love that. Some guys hate using their phone. Some guys like to write it down on paper. Some guys hate paper. I use spreadsheets, simple Microsoft Excel spreadsheets. Some guys hate spreadsheets. Some guys like me love spreadsheets. Use whatever works best for you. Time management is a very personal topic and it's very customizable to each person. One time management system in terms of the, the structure of it, the software or the system you use is gonna be very different for the next guy. So you can use E3D, check system, anything you want. You know, David Allen stuff, doesn't matter, using any system you want. Whatever you know that you will use, that you enjoy and that you'll stick with, use that. And it doesn't matter what it is as long as you're doing E3D. Do you own any big toys like boat, Harley, muscle car, sports car, etc.? Details if so. You know, I'm at a phase in my life right now where I don't give a shit about that anymore. Through my entire 20s, I drove nothing but sports cars. I was really into sports cars, fast stick shift sports cars. Usually little Japanese cars like, you know, 300ZX and things like that. Really enjoyed that. Um, then I stopped giving a shit. I just, I'm at a point in my life, I don't care about that kind of stuff anymore. 
Um, and what's interesting, you can ask your, in terms of goal setting and your vision, which is different than your mission, you can ask yourself, you know, if I had quadruple my net worth, would I buy a blank? And so I did that myself a while ago. I said, okay, if I had, you know, five times, 5X or 10X my net worth, would I buy a Lamborghini? No, I don't give a shit about having a Lamborghini. If I'm trying to sell my car and not own a car, I'm going the other way. No, would I buy a mansion? Like with 25 bedrooms. Now, Pink Firefly would fucking love that, but I'm not going to do that. No, I don't want a mansion. Even if I could easily afford it, you know, no. I could easily afford a Lamborghini right now. I don't have one. Don't want one. Uh, and then I said, um, would I, if I had plenty of money, would I buy a yacht? Hmm. My brain said, hmm. Hmm. So, maybe a boat is in my future. Maybe a really kick-ass yacht. A little yacht? I don't need a big one. We'll see. Um, yeah, so that that's a maybe as I get, you know, as I get to my next phase in the next four or five years. Maybe a really cool boat. I'm thinking that's possible. Yeah. But right now, no. I have a nice house. Um, that's it. My car, if you are curious, is a Lexus 300, e, 300 ESH. Uh, I bought it new in uh, 2016 or 17. But I'm actually trying to get rid of it. I, I can't now because of Corona. No one wants to buy a car. But um, my goal is actually not own a car because of my international lifestyle. <clears throat> Why do you say you agree with Richard Cooper on everything? He is in a monogamous relationship. He ain't alpha male 2.0. Uh, I did not say that I agree with Richard Cooper on everything. What I said was that often when I watch his videos, I am nodding my head in agreement, which is true. I don't agree with anybody on any everything. Uh, yes, he's in a monogamous relationship. He is not an alpha male 2.0 because he said that when he interviewed me on his YouTube channel just a few weeks ago. He blatantly said, yes, I'm not an alpha male 2.0. I have a girl, I have a monogamous. Yes, he said that. Uh, you need to take a deep breath and leave off the decaf. What do you recommend to improve speaking skills? You speak well in your videos. I want to learn that too. Step one in all respects for speaking skills is join your local Toastmasters group. Now that might be difficult right now with COVID depending on your city. Go to toastmasters.com. It's free to, to go to the meetings. They are meetings where you meet once a week. And if you sign up, it's like 30 bucks. And they actually teach you how to be a professional speaker, how to speak well in front of a group. It's phenomenal. It is one of the most phenomenal programs I've ever seen, especially for the money. Now, to be honest and to be clear, I don't agree with all the speaking techniques that they teach. But if you're starting from zero, that's the baseline you want to work from. Get good at it enough where you can stand in front of a podium without any notes and give a speech that's four or five, six minutes and look pretty good. They'll teach you how to do that. And then if you want to continue on, which I did as a real speaker, then you can modify your approach after that. But join Toastmasters. Very, very important. Not only that, not only does it help your speaking skills, it also helps your confidence. You guys who are in sales, like doing telemarketing, it helps your, your reducing your fear. Um, it helps dating skills. Toastmasters is awesome. Highly recommend it. I might almost say it's mandatory for some of you, but I, I won't go that far. Let's see, I lost my fucking place here. What's going on? I noticed you're right up in one of your most recent trips. You mentioned that you didn't gain any weight or actually lost weight. Can you explain? Yes. So when I was in Hong Kong last year, I was in Hong Kong for two weeks and New Zealand and Australia for another two weeks. It's gone for a month. I think so. I lost weight. I was gone. Yeah, it never happened. Never happened before in the history of my life. I always would gain. Well, let me finish your question. Can you explain what your mindset is or system it was to achieve this? I mentioned it here, what you did to be able to keep weight off on traveling. I always put on weight during trips. Dude, my whole life up until last year, I every time I went on a trip, particularly an international trip, I would gain 10 pounds of scale weight. Not 10 pounds of fat. That's not possible to gain it a week. But 10 pounds of scale weight. And I would like, God damn it. Um... That's a very complicated answer. It's a number of things. The biggest thing is to plan ahead and plan what kind of food you're going to eat, especially if salads are not available. So number one for maintaining your weight is salads when you travel. But if you go to like weird places in Asia, you might not be able to get a salad. So whatever the equivalent is, focus on meats and vegetables. Number one. Number two, track your calories. Even if you have to fucking guess, which I did. So I track my calories on my phone every damn day I was gone on that trip. That, that alone will do it. Those two things. There's a bunch of other things. Those are the two big things. Oh, here's the third thing. Uh, I think I've mentioned this before. Walk a lot. So when I do international trips, especially if it's a new city I've never been to before, I will walk two, three, four hours a day. And that you won't lose weight by walking that much, but it'll keep your weight down. It'll prevent you burning so many calories. 
you can fuck up a little bit and you still be okay when you get back home because you're walking so much. I walk a lot when I travel. I like a lot. Like I get blisters and shit. It's awesome. Do you think with the current social climate, it's dangerous to approach VYW if you're 30 plus? No, I don't. Do you have any tips on doing it without ruining your reputation? People are getting called predators, pedophiles, oh God, et cetera, for young, dating young women. All right, we're going back to the 2% rule, motherfucker. What are the odds that your entire world will scream at you and call you a pedophile if you say hi to a 19-year-old at the mall? You're fine, dude. The rare instances I have seen, I've only seen a tiny handful of guys who got in trouble, older guys hitting on younger women at public places like malls who got in trouble and got in trouble with mall security is because these guys are being legit assholes. They were harassing women, following them around, treating like shit, yelling really loud. Of course you're going to get in trouble. If you're normal and you follow normal day game models like Tom Torero stuff, you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. If anything, it is getting easier. I have mentioned this before on my blogs. It is now easier for much older men to date much younger women for a host of reasons. When I started doing this back in, when I was doing day game briefly back in, let's see, when was that? 2009. So I was hitting up 18, 19 year olds when I was in my you know mid to late 30s. It was harder then than it is today. Today it's easier. Much more women, younger women, are much more amenable to date much older men now. There's a lot of reason for that. We could go into that. Maybe we'll go into that in another video. But it's easier. So if anything, you, you have an advantage, dude. Just don't be a weird creeper. Don't be an asshole. Don't be rude. Don't be scary. Be nice. Be low-key, indirect game when you're an older man. All that stuff. You'll be fine. 2% rule, 2% rule, 2% rule, 2% rule. Stop freaking out about shit that will never happen to you. My God, it's an epidemic with men today. Fuck. How to effectively kick a girl out of your room slash home to the outside when things get bad. Ooh. Before things get physical, push as last resort. Okay, don't push a woman. If you live in the United States or Canada, please do not push a woman. You'll go to jail. Okay, if you live in Asia, I guess. You live in the United States like I do, Canada. No. You even do this to a girl, she can call 911 and you will go to jail. Doesn't matter. So don't do that. Um, as she will not agree to leave and continue talking drama. I assume that maybe English is your second language, which is fine. Yes, if there's drama, she needs to leave her home. It really depends on whether she has her own car there or if you drove her there. So if she has her own car there, yes, she needs to leave. If she actually refuses to leave your home, that is hard a hard nextable offense. That is very, very bad. If that's the case, leave the room and go to another room and read a book or something. Work on your laptop, do something else. Do not stay in the same room. And if when she goes, you probably need to hard next her. That is hard next level. If you don't leave my house when I ask you to leave nicely, I'm probably never seeing you again. Now, if she has a car, excuse me, if she doesn't have a car, if you drove her there, here's the technique. And I've used this on a few women historically, not anytime lately, but, you know, different story now. But anyway, you say, would you like me to take you home? Would you like me to take you home? And sometimes they'll say, yeah, I want you to take me home. Great. Get in the car. Don't talk. You're doing a soft next now, so you're not going to talk. Don't talk. Turn on the radio so there's some music so it's not weird. Drive her home. Kick her out. And then <laughs> last time I did this, it was many years ago because I don't do a lot of soft next these days. Last time I did this, uh, as soon as I dropped her off, I pulled out my phone, hit up one of my FBs, drove over to her house, and had sex with her. Not a problem. You have multiple women. But yeah, she doesn't leave your house when you ask. That's hard nextable. That means you probably end the relationship. What change could you expect from a woman that live long-term with an alpha male 2.0 man? Since you met her, has Pink Firefly picked up any alpha 2.0 traits? Be more outcome independent about trivial stuff, etc. Or does she stay the same? Uh, Pink Firefly is extremely feminine. She is hyper feminine. She's on the extreme side of the feminine uh, uh, scale, like I am the extreme side of the masculine scale. We are, we are polar opposites in that respect. So no, she is massively outcome dependent because that's what girls are, especially feminine girls. She always will be. That's just the way it is for her. As I've talked about before, women cannot be long-term happy because they kind of don't want to be and they're not designed that way. So no. Um, but in terms of changes, sure. Um, let me think a sec. Have a drink. <clears throat> yeah, I can think of a few. Hang on a sec. <clears throat> One second, let me check my phone. Wait a minute. Speaking of Pink Firefly, she's texting me. 
Um, 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 more confident. She is uh, Pink Firefly. Since she has known me, we've been. She's known me for quite a while now, almost six years. So we've been in each other's lives for a while. Uh, she doesn't tolerate a lot of crap anymore from the from people that she used to tolerate it from. She's a little more confident. Uh, she's kind of a quiet little wallflower, and she's out of her shell a little bit. Even though, amazingly, interestingly, she is an extrovert and I am an introvert. So this is the weird thing about us. I am an I am a socially outgoing introvert. She is a quiet, shy extrovert. So if her and I go to a, a thing together with a bunch of other people and we sit at a big table with a bunch of other people, I'm the one, you know, talking, hey, what the fuck are we talking and yelling and having a good time and laughing, and she's quiet and not saying anything. But then if someone talks to her, she will talk your fucking ear off, Pink Firefly, for five fucking hours. And so if you wait like 45 minutes, I'm an introvert. So I want to go home and go back get back to work. She wants to stay all night and talk to people. Really weird. But anyway, so in terms of changes, um, a little more confident, that's about it. Do not expect your OLTR wife to ever change. Very, very important. And if you do, that's feminine because that's what women do. Women marry men hoping they will change. Men marry women hoping they will stay the same. And in both cases, they are wrong. <laughs> so do not expect your OLTR wife to change. Plan on her being exactly the way she is for the next 37 years. And if that's a problem for you, you probably shouldn't move in with her. So I don't expect Pink Firefly to ever change, nor do I need her to change, including the negatives of her. I don't expect this. There have been guys, I've seen bits and pieces of this, uh, in the pickup artist world, guys in the red pill, the more traditional right-wing red pill aspects who talk about, you know, empowering your woman and building her up and changing her and fixing all of her problems. And I just want to shoot myself in the fucking head. That is an advanced version of one-itis. You shouldn't give a shit about her. If you want her to change, you shouldn't have moved in with her. You may, you already made the error. I'm not saying you do. I'm just saying in general. I am 25 and about to start a physiotherapy degree. I want to build an alpha 2 panel business when I graduated. Do you really need a degree to start whatever business you want? I doubt it. Is this possible? Have you done this before in this industry or should I start a different business? I would never start a business that requires some kind of some kind of degree. I would never, ever, 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 ever do that. I don't have any degrees. I don't have shit. And I make a lot of money. I would never start a business that requires some kind of degree. Which equity split is better? 50-50 or 41-49? 51-49 and why? Neither alpha male 2.0 business model dictates that you own 100% of any company that is a primary income source. So if it is your business, your alpha 2.0 business, you own 100% of that fucker. If you want to partner with someone, he starts his own LLC. He owns 100% of that. You own 100% of yours. You do the sales and he does the operations or vice versa. You sign a contract on who will do what and the equity split, not the equity split, excuse me, the revenue split and do it that way. That way, if there's a problem, you kick his ass to the curb and you bring in another guy. You don't have those, all this chaos about all the problems guys usually have when they have partners and businesses. You don't want to do that. Are there exceptions? Are there rare exceptions of partnerships working? Yes, the exception proves the rule. Own 100% of your own company. That is a primary income source. You can own bits and pieces of companies as investments or side incomes. That's okay. But your primary business, own 100% of it. Solves, it, it avoids a lot of problems. <laughs> Did you ever have sex with Lynn P? Oh, shit. I assume you know who I'm talking about. Please say yes, because if you do, I will consider you a god. I'm a god either way, dude. <laughs> My godhood is not conditional, based on who I have sex with. Uh, yes, I know who you're talking about, and the answer is you're going to have to ask her. Um, she's a sweetheart, and I'm very proud of what she's accomplished. When starting out as a young guy, is it feasible to have three FBs if you're focused on building your empire, or is that too much because I have a high sex drive? Three FBs is great. FBs, no. MLTRs, no. Two, three MLTRs, if you're focused on building your empire, no. Three FBs is fine. Three is my favorite number, so that's fine. No, you're, you're good to go, dude. What are your thoughts about living and investing in Argentina? Don't cry for me, Argentina. Um... Living and investing are two very, very, very different things. So just because you, a place is a good place to live, it might be a terrible place to invest. Just because a place might be a really good place to invest, you would probably never want to live there. Five Flags, if, you, if you're interested in that concept, is spreading out this 
spreading out these different areas into different countries instead of taking one country and doing everything there, which is not a good idea in the time of the collapsing Western civilization. So living in Argentina is fine. Uh, I would never live there. I'll talk about why in a second. But living there, if you're an Alpha 2.0 location-dependent income, um, perfectly fine. Cool place. Fun place. Women are decently cute. Um, South America's fun. There are maniacs down there, like the Brazilians, but it's kind of you don't care if you're an Alpha 2.0 and you don't have any money there. It's fine. Um, I would never live there. Uh, it's just too chaotic. If I had to deal with those fucking airports in Buenos Aires, I, I would shoot myself in the fucking head. I can't do it. It's just too crazy there. I was going to live there at one point. I actually was thinking strongly about moving to Buenos Aires. And then I spent some time there and no. Love it. Love visiting there. Would never live there. But you could live there. Sure. Investing in Argentina. Argentina is part of South America. As I've said many times before, South America is the world's crazy uncle. The crazy, wacky uncle in the corner who says all this crazy shit. So the South Americans are crazy. They do great and they do awesome and they're amazing and then they destroy their economy and then it's horrible. Then they do great again, then they have a military coup and destroy everything. And then they do great again and they destroy their currency and it's horrible. And that's South America. That's how South America works. In particular, Argentina. Yes. So can you make money as a speculator in Argentina? Yes. Investing, no. But speculating, yes. If you are very smart, very careful, you're on the ground there, you really understand that market, there are, there's a lot of opportunities when you have an environment like this where you can make a lot of money as a speculator, not as an investor. Uh, very dangerous, you need to be very smart. If you're not willing to put in all that time and effort, then I wouldn't do it. <clears throat> in your blog under the Western Collapse section, you stated two things that caught my eye. First, that Europe will eventually become an Islamic region and anyone who refuses to escape there will have to learn Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. I was exaggerating and I was being sarcastic. You don't literally need to learn Arabic. I think you're fucked if you stay in Europe. Oh, yeah. And there will be more Arabic as time goes on. Oh, yeah. But I'm, I was exaggerating. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, and second, within 100 years or so, the only, countries, the only countries such as Australia and New Zealand will become the last remnants of Western civilization. That is incorrect. I did not say that. What I said was... Australia and New Zealand, likely, and I could be wrong, we're guessing, will not collapse, but they will be the only Western countries that will not collapse. Instead, they will just stagnate. Both Australia and New Zealand will just sit there floating like a turd in the pool. They're not going to sink. They're not going to fly. They're just going to sit there for various reasons. So reasons that are beyond the topic of this AMA, um, while Canada, United States, and Europe will definitely collapse. That's true. They will not be the only remnants. There will always be remnants of the Western civilization. If America collapsed next year, 10, 20, 30 years from now, 100 years from now, there would be remnants of America. Maybe America will be this little teeny tiny Delaware-sized country where Washington, D.C. is. There will be remnants, but it won't be America anymore. You know. That being the case, <clears throat> where do you see America and Canada transforming into in the next century or two if they cease to become Western civilizations? You need to Google Caleb Jones' blog, How Bad Will It Get?, and I go through the five different scenarios that may occur in terms of Western collapse. I don't know which of these five will occur. I just know one of them will occur. Let's see if I can remember them. First one, which is the best one, the least bad one, is secession. So states breaking away from the United States. That would be the least bad scenario. It may not happen. But that would be places like less left-wing places in the United States would do this, like Texas, New Hampshire, uh, Alaska would break away and form their own countries. That'd be one. Another one would be currency collapse, which I think is the most likely. That will be either inflationary or deflationary. It could be either one. The next one would, could be war, primarily in Europe. I don't think you're going to have a, a, a large-scale war in the United States, but certainly in Europe you could do that. Uh, the next one, which I think is the least likely, is totalitarianism. Very unlikely, but it's possible. Um, the fifth one is slow decline into irrelevance. So that would be like Portugal. Portugal, 400 years ago, ruled the entire world. People don't know that. Now, today, Portugal, is Portugal gone? No, it's still there. There's still a country called Portugal. It's this little teeny tiny fly speck on Europe's ass. It's about this big. It's this silly little country that's bankrupt. The IMF has to keep bailing them out because they don't know what the fuck they're doing. And that's Portugal now. So the United States could do this or Canada could do this. You could have, as I mentioned earlier, a hundred years from now, there is still a United States. It's this big. And there's all these Mexican and Chinese countries around it. And it's this big, and that's it. And they, they, it kind of like um, 
these old British guys, these really old British guys who wax about the greatness of the British Empire 100 years ago, that will be the American in 100 years from now. These old men like, you know, back in 1950, we ruled the world. Today we're a little turd, but it could be that. I don't know which of those scenarios will occur. No one knows which of those scenarios will occur. I just know one of them will occur. <clears throat> you advise against any college and simply to get started on your business. Correcto. Do not go to college unless you are A, going to be a doctor, and B, you are 100% sure you want to be a doctor for the rest of your life. You're not going to be a doctor because your mom or your dad is wagging their finger in your face saying, you're going to be a doctor. If you're sure you want to be a doctor and you're going to be a fucking doctor, then go to college. If that does not apply to you, do not go to fucking college. God damn it. The business I want to start demands I have some licensure. Okay, we're, we're doing this again. I would not start a company that required me to have any sort of, of license that required a certain amount of education. I would not do that. There are too many ways to make a shitload of money without any education. I do not have a college degree. I don't even have a high school diploma. I didn't drop out of high school, but I didn't graduate because I got too many Fs on my report card. I had no education. I was making a six-figure income by the time I was 27 years old in 1990s dollars. You don't need to go to college to make fucking money. You just don't. Matter of fact, I would argue that it's harder to make a high income, not a decent income like 80 grand a year. But if you want to make 250,000 a year plus, I think it's harder if you go to college. I think it's actually harder because of all the bullshit they fill in your head and all the debt you incur if you're an American. I want to start private practice as soon as possible. If my university pays for college, they are, and I can get licensed in two years. Is it worth doing? I'm 24. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do this. Now, if you, if you, I don't know if you're going to be a doctor. It sounds like you're not going to be a doctor. If you're going to be a doctor, yes, but it wouldn't, I, you're not going to be a doctor. You just said two years and you're 24. You're not going to be a doctor until you're 29 or 30. So no, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Be a doctor and go to college and start making a six figure income when you hit 29 for the rest of your life, fine, or don't go to college. How to command respect from people. The alpha male 2.0 does not give a shit about respect. That is an alpha male 1.0 trait. I don't give a shit who respects me. That is not a factor in my life. I do not give a rat fuck if anyone respects me or not. As a matter of fact, um, a few weeks ago, there was a random troll on YouTube, which you get on YouTube, and he was saying, I would respect you more if you just cheated on your wife instead of having an open marriage. And I responded, I don't care about respect. I care about happiness, and I'm pretty sure I'm happier than you. You shouldn't give a shit if people respect you. I don't care if my dad respects me or my mom respects me or my kids respect me or my friends respect me or women respect me. All I care about is that I'm really, really, really happy. Then, by the way, when you have a pure outcome independent attitude about not giving a fuck if people respect you, guess what happens? People start respecting you. I don't care if my dad respects me, but he does. I don't care if my wife respects me, but she does. I don't care if even my customers respect me. As long as a certain percentage of you buy my products, I can make all the money I want. I don't care about respect, but a lot of you do respect me. So you can actually get respect by not trying, but you shouldn't care. If no one respected me, I still wouldn't care. I wouldn't care. It's not an issue I have. You shouldn't have that either if you want to be an alpha 2.0. If you want to be an alpha male 1.0, respect is a big fucking deal. Your whole life is being respected. Oh my God. But if you're alpha 2.0, you shouldn't give a rat fuck about that. You should be care about being happy. So I know you propose, you propose open relationship models where both the man and woman can get sex outside of the relationship. And while things like jealousy are just remnants of your inner grog. Yeah, you read my book. Good. What about the woman's inner grogetta? <laughs> inner grogetta. Great. Love it which caused her to catch feelings and fall in love if she's getting dicked down well by another man. Isn't that always a looming concern with open relationships? You need to Google Black Dragon blog, won't she fall in love with another guy? And you need to read that article. I have literally never seen, this is one of those things that everyone worries about that never happens. I have literally never seen, out of the hundreds of scenarios I've seen, the hundreds of couples who are doing this, I have never once seen a properly managed, open, OLTR-ish relationship where the woman fell in love with another guy she was fucking. I have literally never seen it. I'm sure statistically it's happened somewhere, but I've never seen it. And I'm the guy that people hit, hit up and email when these kinds of things happen. And I have never seen it. 
What I have seen, a few celebrity examples of open marriages or open relationships that were completely mismanaged by the man, and that happened. For example, the woman was not only hooking up with other guys, the man, the husband or the boyfriend, was allowing her to date other guys, go on trips with other guys, spend the night with other guys, have long romantic conversations on the phone with other men. No, if you do that, yes, she probably will fall in love with some other guy, of course. But in an OLTR, none of that stuff is allowed. And if she even wants to do that shit, you should dump her immediately. You see that how this works? So, but go read that article. I explain all this. This is not a concern if you follow all the rules I talk about, the cardinal rules for OLTRs. That's why, by the way, the OLTR is emotionally exclusive, to guard against that kind of garbage. I have, I'll say it one more time before I go on. I have never seen a woman in an OLTR, boyfriend, girlfriend relationship, or marriage, who is having sex with other men, and a lot of them don't, especially in the OLTR marriage. Women over 33, they don't have sex with other men. A lot of them don't, but ones that do, I've never seen it where the woman falls in love with another guy, catches feelings, and then there's all this drama and chaos with the relationship. I have literally never seen it. I've only seen it where the boyfriend or the husband was a goddamn beta male or a fucking pussy or not paying attention because he was stupid and let the women go hog wild and actually date and have emotional romantic relationships with other men. That is a polyamorous relationship. That is not OLTR. That is not what I endorse. If you want to be polyamorous, that's great. Do MLTRs, where she's allowed to get romantic with her men. Now you don't care. So the Alpha Male 2.0 model covers all these different models. Kind of nice. So many guys worry about that, and it doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen, unless you're a fucking beta. And they see these examples of these stupid celebrities, or these stupid beta males, these beta male cuck husbands, who let their women like go on dates and go on relationships with other men, and then these women dump these... Well, of course it's going to happen. These aren't alpha males. Fuck. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. How would you recommend a newbie start out when marketing his first online course? I mentioned this earlier. You need to start building your list as fast as you can. If that means you need to create a list by purchasing things or building your own list on things like LinkedIn, you start with that first. You start cultivating a list as soon as you can, as soon as you can, even before you develop your course. Cultivate that list with free content or whatever you need, a blog, an email newsletter, what have you, videos, doesn't matter. Cultivate that list then come out with your course. You don't need a very big list. You can have just a few hundred people on that list and make a lot, a lot of money. We had a guy in the SMIC program a few months ago. He started his first online course, his first brand new Alpha 2.0 business. He made, was it $36,000? I think so, $36,000 in one weekend. <laughs> Kick ass, awesome, it can be done. Hey Caleb, I know this is not the most appropriate question for this channel. Any question is appropriate. Are you kidding, it's me but I've been following you, your books and blogs. I know you can help me, or at least I'd like to know your opinion. Question is, how can I stop feeling fucking depressed all day while I'm in quarantine due to coronavirus with a toxic mom? How I am 60, ah, I am 16 years old from Mexico. You are not an adult. You are not allowed in this YouTube channel. <laughs> I followed your advice and now I have two small businesses in completely different industries. Wow, good for you. Although I get my own money, I feel... Okay, so if we pause here, everyone watching this video, this goddamn 16-year-old Mexican kid started his two Alpha 2.0 businesses and is making money. What's your fucking excuse? This is the beauty of really young guys or guys who don't know better. They just, they just take action. They don't say, well, what if my niche isn't correct? Well, what if this and what if that? He took action, now he's getting money. Good for you. Good for you, dude. Excellent. Very proud of you. Uh, although I own my own money, I feel fucking depressed almost all day. I want to get out away or cry. This is making me more needy with girls, and I don't like that. What would you do in this case? First of all, I would hold off on the girls for the moment, especially if you're 16. Um, what is the age of majority in Mexico? Is it 16 or is it 18? Oh, you know, it's 18. It's 18. So you're not an adult yet. You got, you got another year and a half before you're an adult. So that's step one, make plans to move out the split second you turn 18. If you can move out now, do it. Maybe you can't, I understand, but move out as soon as you can. Until you move out, don't be home. Don't be home. Take your laptop or whatever you need and go to a Starbucks or a coffee shop or whatever. I don't know what city you live in. Go out and stay away from your mother all day. You don't live there, you just sleep there. I have guys in your scenario. Uh, younger guys who can't afford to move out yet. So they, they, what you do with those with the toxic family members is you're never home. 
You're never, ever, ever, I've known people who've done this, women too. You're never, ever home. You wake up, take a shower, get your stuff and leave. Go to the library, go to a Starbucks, work. Do live your life outside of your home. You go home <clears throat> nine, 10 o'clock at night and then go to bed. You don't need to talk to your fucking mom. Do, make the best you can. That's how you do it. Don't focus on the girls right now. I wouldn't do that. You can if you want, but I wouldn't. If you're going through that kind of chaos and move out as soon as you can. But well done. <clears throat> Excuse me, another drink. I haven't talked this much in a long fucking time. How are we doing the camera? We're good good? Cool. All right. Hang on. The microphone's still working? Microphone check. One, two, one, two. Yeah, we're good. All right. Oh. Agua. Do alpha male 2.0s get in love? Yes, it's called OLTR. I am an extreme alpha male 2.0 and I am extremely in love. Our name is Pink Firefly. So it's called an OLTR, open long-term relationship that is with a girlfriend-boyfriend relationship or it is when you are married under those models and it is non-monogamous. You're allowed to have sex with anyone you want, whenever you want, without having to check in with her, but you can still completely love her. I've got that. Now, here's the objective in terms of falling in love. You need to love without one-itis and most men can't do this. So you love a woman. So I'll give you my example. I love Pink Firefly more than I've ever loved a woman in my entire life and that's saying a lot. I haven't been in love a lot, but I've been in love before. It's almost on a spiritual level. She is as close to perfect as you can get for a woman for me. And if there was a consistent problem in our marriage, I would kick her out within 48 hours and I would not look back and I would not regret it. I didn't say I wouldn't be sad, but I wouldn't regret it because I can love without having one -itis. If you love a woman and said, I'm gonna do anything possible to make sure she never leaves, that's one -itis, and now you're fucked. And now she has your balls like this. And all she has to do is squeeze those fuckers. And you'll say, okay, 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 I'll do whatever you want. That's power. A woman can't have power over you. You want to get to the point emotionally where you can love completely without having that woman have power over you. That's how an alpha male 2.0 loves. Do you ever get a break? Yes, I take Sundays off. Uh, that's not a religious thing. That's just how it worked out. I'm not referring to things like going on holidays, but taking a step back and deciding for a single day you do stupid things like eating McDonald's or contacting your ex. Contacting your ex? I know, oh, here we go. I know you would not do that, but you get my point. Cute, good, good save. I find sometimes I need a mental break and not to think much about the consequences of my actions, but rather just how I can enjoy myself right in that moment. Of course, yes. I have said before at my blogs, my business blogs, ideally you want to take, especially if you're a hardcore workaholic like I am, you want to take, ideally, once every three months, take three days off, do a long weekend and get out of your circle, go to the beach or something, go somewhere else and just completely relax and don't work. I have what I call, not what I call, what my mentors call free days because I follow my own advice. I do online courses. I purchase them. I pay coaches. I do everything I recommend you guys do. So I have coaches who make a lot, a lot of money and they forced me last year. I didn't like it, but I'm okay with it now to start taking Sundays off. We're literally every Sunday with exceptions occasionally. Um, from midnight to midnight, I can't do any work. I can't check an email. I can't look at my blogs. I can't even think about my work. No work, so my brain completely relaxes. So on Monday, bam, I hit it hard, and I do, and I go full bore, 110% until Saturday night. So yes, take time off, give yourself a break if you are a hard-driving workaholic like me. Now, a significant percentage of you in my audience have the opposite problem. You aren't working enough. You're jerking off on the fucking internet all day. You're bitching at SAWs all day. You're reading blogs and you're commenting, but you're not actually doing any fucking work. You're reading books and you're mentally masturbating and you're not doing any work. You guys need to ignore what I just said and work your asses off. But you guys like me, yeah, take some time off. Very important. Cheat days on your diet. I still do that. I'm not supposed to, but I still do that. Yeah. All right. Do all that stuff. Yes. Hello, Caleb. Hello. I really respect what you do and aspire to have a life as happy and as free as yours. I've been following your woman advice since I was 18 years old. It has not failed me. Cool. In regards to that, many of the rules, in regards to many of the rules and points you state in terms of relationship management, I find it to be very black and white. It's not black and white. It's just very clear. <clears throat> I haven't broken any of the cardinal rules, but what would happen if I do? Drama. 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 You will experience massive drama. Not immediately, but eventually. If you stop doing the cardinal rules, you will start experiencing more drama from the women in your life. Now, if your answer is, I don't care, what? so what if I have drama? If you're one of these European guys or Hispanic guys who kind of like drama, 
Great, ignore my advice and do whatever you want. If you don't like drama, you must follow all the cardinal rules. That's the answer. It's just that many of your points are binary. Binary? Well, yeah, do this and don't do this, correct. And there's not much gray area in the middle which I find unrealistic. I have been following all the cardinal rules consistently without break, without error, without problems, minor errors, but without stopping for 13 years straight. It's realistic. The reason you're asking this question is because there's a cardinal rule in there somewhere or two that you don't want to follow. You're one of these guys who says, but I don't want to see her once a week. I want to see her four times a week. You can see her more than once a week if you make her your OLTR, but if she's an FB or MLTR, only once a week. Sorry, but I don't want to. Okay, you don't want to. Then break the rules and get drama. And I don't know how much you've read my blogs. The comments on my blogs, if you've read them for many, many years, you have seen in the comments, a lot of these guys do this over email, but in the comments, some guy will say, well, so what if I stop having sex with other girls? Well, so what if I start seeing her once a week? That's no big deal. I said, you're going to fuck yourself. Don't do it. And they're like, oh, you know what the fuck you're talking about. Six months later, year later, year and a half later, what do they always do? They always come back and say, you were right. I stopped having sex with other girls and she started giving me drama. I started seeing her once a week. She started giving me drama, blah, blah, blah. We broke up. Right. Drama. You will incur drama and problems if you don't follow the cardinal rules. You don't have to follow the cardinal rules. As I've said many times, I'm an individualist. You do whatever you want. I don't give a fuck. Especially if you don't mind drama. But if you don't mind drama, I'm not sure why you're following my content. But if you don't want drama, you gotta follow the cardinal rules and it is very realistic. I've been doing it for 13 years straight. I will continue to do it for the rest of my life. It is realistic. You just don't want to do it. <clears throat> can an anonymous business blog like, can an anonymous business like a blog on sensitive stuff work financially? Yes, the Black Dragon blog was making a lot of money before I came out as Caleb Jones. Yeah, I was anonymous, sure. As a general question, can you make money on information products and stay anonymous? Yes, I did it. Now, it's better if you don't. It's easier to market if people can see your face. That's just marketing 101. You'll get more business if people can see your face. Um, but you can. Yeah, the Black Dragon blog was more than paying my bills. That stupid little blog years ago, before I ever came out as myself. Sure, yeah, you can do it. Just a little harder. What advice do you have for dealing with the grief of being gen gen genitally mutilated slash circumcised? Uh, well, there's a difference between mutilated and circumcised, right? I mean, you, technically circumcision is mutilation, I agree, but you know what I mean. Especially for those of us who got it worse than average and can barely feel anything. Oh. So here's my overall answer to these types of medical things is... If you have a medical problem that is causing problems in your life, you go to a doctor and you say, fucking fix me. Or what will it take to fix me if I need surgery? What will it take? And if he says, duh, 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 you say, thank you very much, fuck you. You fire him, you go to the next doctor. How can I fix this problem? What will it take to fix it? And if he says, well, maybe this and maybe that, maybe, then you try a few things. Okay, I tried that, it didn't work. Now what do I need to do? Well, I don't know. Fuck you, thank you, go to the third doctor. You may have to go through four or five doctors to find one that has a solution for you or at least an alleviation for you. Maybe there's no solution for your problem. I have no idea. Uh, maybe there isn't. But I would do everything possible to go to as many doctors as I could to fix the fucking problem. I am amazed at men who tolerate long-term physical issues. For example, a guy's dick stops getting hard and he just puts up with it. If my dick stopped working tomorrow, do you realize I would be down at the doctor's office the next day? And I'd say, motherfucker, fix me. And if he gave me a bunch of horse shit, I would fire him and go to the next doctor until it was fixed. Guys put up with this stuff. I'm not saying you're putting up with it. I'm just giving you the overall answer. Um, beyond that, I don't know. I, I, I would need more information on your problem. But that's where I would start. Start seeing a duck. Well, I tr now, you're going to say, I tried that. It didn't work. Exactly. You're going to have to do three, four, five doctors. Not one or two. And then throw your arms there and say, I guess I'm fucked. Which is what most people do. No. And I'm sorry, dude, that sucks. That's terrible. Uh, for the record, I'm against circumcision. Uh, circumcision, can't talk. I am against that. Uh, I'm not having any more kids, but if I had more children, if I had a son today, I would not circumcise him, and I would uh, have him make that decision when he was a teenager. I wouldn't do it. I think that's uh, immoral and ethical. So I agree. I don't make it a big fucking issue like a lot of guys do, but I agree it's a problem. Hey, Caleb, are the Unchained Man and Big Income for Little Work? Cool. 
And the freedom of location independent the freedom of location independent income sounds amazing. It is. Greatest thing in the world. I am a slightly extroverted college student studying mechanical engineering with a CS minor. CS minor, computer science. Since I'll be in college for another couple years and should have a solid technical base when I graduate. What would be the best ways to apply my non-academic time to develop the sales and marketing skills necessary to start a product-based Alpha Tupino business? You're not going to like my answer. I would drop out of college immediately and I would go get a job at marketing, at marketing or sales in a big company as I talk about. I would not put up with this. You said two more years? What did you say? Let's see here. For another couple years. Yeah, fuck that. Quit. I know you're not going to take that advice. I know you're going to follow the example of, boy, I've been here. I, I, got, I got to keep going and my mom would be mad. I understand that. But I give advice as if I woke up in your shoes. If I woke up in your shoes, I would immediately drop out of college and immediately go get a job at a big company, ideally in a growth industry, but not necessarily in the sales or marketing department and learn that way. If you don't want to do that, I have a feeling you don't, although you're wrong, then um, the best way to apply my non-academic time to books, read sales and marketing books. Jay Abraham, um, Brian Tracy, start reading those guys, the classics, read the books and start, and start making a marketing plan for something you can sell. You should also start doing research on the products that you can sell, high margin products. If it's an alpha tubital product-based business, that's fine. They better be high margin. You need to do that research too. Start doing that now. <clears throat> I'm secondarily interested in remote technical contracting, consulting, any, idea, any ideas on that? Uh, I have many ideas, that's too general a question. How can I increase the frequency of anal sex? You just do it. You just tell your women, I want to have anal sex. And if they go, no, then she's probably not sexually compatible with you. You need to go get more women who either don't mind anal sex or enjoy anal sex. One of the things that men do is they put up with women who are not sexually compatible with the men's desires. If you really like anal sex and you're dating FBs, MLTRs who don't like anal sex, I bet that's your problem, then you're dating the wrong women. You need some new women who either don't mind anal sex or enjoy anal sex. Now, if you've never talked about it, uh, you never brought it up, well, then you're just being a beta. Do you think I have any problem whatsoever telling the women I have sex with what I want them to do during sex? No. Daddy tells you what to do and you fucking do it. During sex, I'm the biggest alpha male 1.0 in the universe. I do whatever I want. Now, if they hate it, they can say, no, I don't want to do that. And I make a mental note. And if it's something I really like, she's probably going to be out. It's that simple. You decide what your sex life looks like. Not other women. Not women, not men, not society. You. How to know if a business is going to be profitable before you get into it. In other words, how to know if a business idea is good or not. All the research I talk about through the niche, find a niche and try to solve a problem that niche has or apply to a need, a strong need that niche has. Now, like other questions in this AMA, you are overthinking this. You are probably one of these guys who is scared to start a business in case you might do it wrong. Do it wrong. Make a guess and get into the game. Start your fucking business. When I started my first business, I did a bazillion things wrong. But I eventually got to six-figure income pretty quick. So it works. So if you are wrong, you're wrong. You can always course correct as you're doing your business. Don't be one of these anal guys, these anal high Q college educated guys who are terrified of starting a business because it may not be perfect because society has trained them that everything has to be perfect. Don't. Make your best guess and then get into the game, start your fucking business and then modify your approach as you go along. Very important. <clears throat> any advice for those with skin diseases, any advice for those with diseases that heavily affect their appearance, skin health, etc. Using a hair system for covering your baldness is one thing. Dealing constantly with skin diseases is another. Um, it depends on whether or not it is visible. It is visible on your face or hands. I don't know if it is or not or if it's on your body. So if it's not visible on your face or hands, you just warn women before you have sex. If you've got a perfectly normal face and hands and you've got a big red blotch on your chest or whatever, I don't know what your problem is. Then as right as you're as she's taking her clothes off you say by the way <clears throat> i have this thing on my skin it, it looks a little weird it's not contagious it won't hurt you just let you know blah, blah, blah. and then just proceed as if it doesn't bother you and likely it won't bother her now if you have a skin condition on your face you look like fucking freddy krueger or whatever i don't know what you, i don't know what your problem is you need to google w mitchell 
Uh, I think he's dead. Is he still alive? I think he's still alive. W. Mitchell is a motivational speaker. He is a guy who got in a motorcycle accident and later a plane accident. He burned his entire face. He looks like Freddy Krueger. He can't walk. He's in a wheelchair. Once he burned himself and got into a wheelchair, he married his hot nurse and then became a self-made multimillionaire with his skin condition. So if you have something actually on your face, go Google him and read his shit. He is amazing. He's extraordinary. I've met him. He's extraordinary. Fantastic guy. <clears throat> how can I stop feeling jealous of women? I think you mean, how can you stop feeling jealous for women or regarding women? Uh, that is a very big topic. You need to read The Unchained Man. I have an entire chapter on that. I have a more advanced chapter on that in the Ultimate Open Relationships Manual. A number of exercises you can do. You need to start asking yourself, why are you jealous? Why do you give a shit? You need to devote yourself to a strong mission or at least strong goals that have nothing to do with women. You need to have multiple women in your life at all times. You need to start focusing on women who are more attractive, not average girls or ugly girls. Because the problem with a lot of guys is they have, they have sex with a lot of average or ugly girls and then a hot girl comes along and they, they get one eye and they get jealous and all those things. It's a comprehensive thing. You also need to practice. The first time you do it, you're going to feel a little jealous. The very first time I, I did a non-monogamous relationship where I knew the girl I was dating in an MLTR was going to fuck another guy, I got a little jealous. And then the second time it happened, I got less jealous. Third time it happened, I got a little jealous. And fourth time, I didn't give a fuck. So practice. So all those things, you need to get the Unchained Man. Uh, it's seven bucks. If you want a more advanced thing on, on uh, jealousy techniques, anti-jealousy techniques, you need to go to haveopenrelationships.com and the Ultimate Open Relationship Manual. I go entire, a whole chapter, whole thing about that. Exercises and everything. Works. Uh, I know you are an introvert. Yes, I am. But have, you been, and, but have been wondering about this for a while. It is commonly known that you become the, an average of the five people you spend the most amount of time with. That's generally true. I understand you may be more self-motivated than others along with the introvert, but how would you go about surrounding yourself with these types of people slash inspirational sources if you do not have enough in your circle at the moment? Where would you meet them? Use characters in movies, books. Do you have a system for networking with these types of people? So here's the deal. Um, I am an introvert, so I don't have quality answers to that question. And I get that question a lot. Caleb, how do I make friends? I'm not the guy to ask, dude. I don't have a social life that is not already attached to my woman life, my family life, or my business life. In other words, I have literally no friends that are just friends that are not women I'm having sex with or people I'm working with or people I'm related to. So I have people I hang out with all the time, but they're people in other areas of my life. So I just don't have that skill set because I've never needed it because I'm an introvert. Now here's something else. When you're an introvert, you have a slight edge in this, you the, become the average of the five people. The guys who are most susceptible to hanging out with their five loser friends are extroverted guys. So when you're an extrovert, it's more important to be aware of your social, social scenario than it is when you're an introvert. If you're not hanging out with a lot of people, then you're okay because you're not hanging out with losers. Does that make sense? But in terms of how to make, how to find inspirational people in real life and hanging out with people, I'm just not the guy to ask. I wish I was. And I've had other people ask me that question. How do you make friends? How do you find people to hang out with? I just, I'm, I'm an introvert. I don't know. You have to find other resources for the internet. How about role models? It's the same question. How about role models or other figures of wisdom or resources? Of course, you are one yourself. Well done for that. But if you aren't someone, is it possible to converse with and thus not a friend? So um, there are two types of mentors. There are mentors you know personally, and there are mentors from afar. And I've had both, mostly mentors from afar. Those would be people you read in books, people on the internet you like, um, celebrities who you want to copy, their lifestyles, celebrities you like. Uh, there's not very many of those, but a few. So you can lean into those people, and I did. So in my 20s, my biggest mentor from afar was Brian Tracy. He was a, instrumental in helping me. He never knew me. I just read his books and listened to his audio cassettes. We had cassettes back then. Um, he was amazing. Later, I met him and worked with him a little bit in my late 20s, early 30s. It was a big event for me. Um, in my 30s, my biggest mentor was Harry Brown. How I, uh, let's see, what, what's the name of the book? Um, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. So, and then later it was Robert Ringer. These are all guys I read. I didn't know these guys, except for Brian Tracy. Harry Brown I did uh, communicate with before he died over email for a little bit. It was nice. But yeah. 
Uh, let's see. Did you... Hmm, okay, this is another did you fuck so-and-so question. Uh, I'm not going to answer these questions anymore. You guys are all trying to get me in trouble. You start trying to start internet drama? So here's the deal, dude. I'm the man and she's the woman. So if she came out and said, I had, we, her and I had sex, that would just make me look good, right? If I came out and said we had sex, that might make her look terrible because it would depend on whether or not she has a boyfriend or married now or has kids now, depending on her social scenario or relationship scenario, which changes often with women. So that means that if you want to know if that's happened, if I've hooked up with whoever, you're going to have to ask her, not me. And by the way, this person, go ahead and ask her, dude. Hit her up on Instagram or a members only site or whatever the fuck she's got. She'll tell you. She'll let you know in unknown certain terms, but I can't answer that question. So there you go. How can I build the confidence to approach really attractive women? You attract approach, you approach attractive women first, then get the confidence second. So I've said this many times. In 2007, when I started doing this, from, from day one, right after my divorce, right after I moved out and got on the online dating sites, I made a pact with myself. I would only hook up or at least approach really attractive women. Women on a scale of one to 10 to me were an eight, nine, or a 10. 10s are very rare where I live, so it's mostly eights and nines. <clears throat> and I just did it. You just do it. And yes, you'll feel a little nervous. But here's the deal. Once you do it once or twice the first time and it works, all of a sudden you're like, oh, Oh, really hot girls will have sex with me. So the second one gets much easier. Third one gets really easy. And then by then, it's a pattern. It's, it's a habit now. So you do that first. You don't say, how do I get the confidence to? You do all the usual confidence stuff in my books and blogs, things like that, online courses. You can do all those things and you should. But you don't wait until this magical moment where God comes down from heaven and anoints you as worthy of hitting on hot girls. You just start doing it. Here's a little, here's a little tidbit from that. Um... I hate using the 1 to 10 scale, and I, if you read the blog post I wrote called um, the 1 to 10 attractive scale is bullshit, it is. I don't like using this, this model, but I, when communicating with other people, you have to because that's the model you guys understand. So in the 1 to 10 attractive scale, here's, here's how this works. Generally speaking, there are exceptions to everything, but gen, generally speaking, this is how it works. Women who are 10s know they're 10s. Now, they're very rare. 10s are very, very rare. So it's usually not an issue. But women who are 10s, they're difficult because they know they're 10s. Women who are 7s and 6s think they're 8s and 9s. 8s and 9s think they're 7s or 6s. And the reason for that is when you're an 8 or a 9, that means you're a 10 with one or two little flaws. And when you have one or two little flaws, but you're gorgeous other than that, as a woman, that's all you think about. That's all you see in the mirror. You just stress out about that. And so what happens over the course of many years, you start thinking like you're a 6 or a 7, when in fact you're a fucking 9 or an eight, you're hot as fuck. Very common. Therefore, hooking up with eights and nines is not as difficult as guys seem to think. It's just not. It's not. In many cases, it's harder to hook up with the sevens because the sevens are walking around thinking they're all that. These fat black girls who think they're just smoking hot because all these black guys trying to hook up with them, that's an extreme example. So it's not as hard as you think. It really isn't. I was surprised at how easy it was. I'm not saying it was easy. But back in 2007, when I started doing this, and started getting reasonably successful reasonably soon with really attractive women, I was surprised that it wasn't that hard. It's not that hard. Is it possible to make one million a year in an Alpha 2.0 business? Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. And how long would it take to get there? I'm 24. That depends on several factors. Number one, how hard you are willing to work over a long, long period of time. Number two, the margins of the products or services you are selling. Number three, how well you are niched. So if you're not very well niched, it's going to take you longer. If you're very narrowly niched, it could be much shorter for you. Number four, how hard you work on building your business skills. So all these things, and I have no idea what you're going to do or what you want to do or what you plan on doing. One thing about that is if you're going to make a million dollars a year, the Alpha Tupino model of working no more than 30 hours a week, that's not going to be you. You can work less than 30 hours a week, but if you want to make a million a year, you want to hit the big money, you're going to be working a lot more than 30 hours a week. I work a lot more than 30 hours a week. So you're going to be more like me. You're going to be working pretty damn hard. Now, if you like to work, that's okay. If you can work whenever you want, that's very important. And you don't have to work those 30 hours. That's very, very critical. Very, very important. I don't have to work the hours I work. I don't have to. I'd be just fine without it. 
and I like working, and I work whenever I choose to work. No one tells me, Caleb, you have to work at these times and these times. I work when I choose. But I'm just saying you're going to be working more than 30 hours a week if you want to hit the big numbers like that. I'm scared. Hang on a second. Check the number. Hello, hello. Testing. Good. I'm scared that the Alpha 2.0 lifestyle won't make me any happier. It will. I've been battling depression all my life, and I'm ready to make a change, but sometimes I slip back in. Mm, I understand. If I commit to Alpha 2.0, can it truly make me happy for the better? Alpha male 2.0 with a, and you're going to hate this, but I'm right, with a qualified therapist. If you've been fighting depression your whole life, you need, and maybe you are, maybe you are, but I'll cover that in a second. You need to see a therapist and see that person at least once a week, at least an hour a week, at least twice a week would be better. Again, if I woke up one, I've never felt depressed in my entire life. I don't even know what that would feel like to be sad about something that I couldn't put my finger on. It's just not part of my being. But if I started feeling depressed, fucking hell, the next day I'd be on the phone with therapists. I'd be like, fucking fix me. I'll do whatever you want. Now, as I said, like I said about the doctors earlier, the first therapist will probably suck. And you're probably gonna say, well, I tried that. She was a bitch. Fire her and go to the next one. Or him, do the next therapist. He was an asshole. Do the next one. You might have to go to three or four therapists to find the best one for you. Do that. Don't make excuses. If you currently have a therapist and you're still depressed, then it's not fucking working. You need a new therapist or a second therapist, whatever the fuck. Find someone else. Don't make excuses. Alpha male 2.0 will help you make more happy and will help you be less depressed. In addition to you seeing a therapist, both those things together. And I mean that, man. Don't fuck around with this stuff. If you're depressed, get help. Get fucking help. There's too many men on the internet in the world, especially today, who are depressed, who refuse to get any help. You're an idiot. Get fixed. Get help. You can't do this on your own. Uh, okay, this is a three-part question. What is wrong with the model of growing a traditional business to a large scale and then after working on it, say, 10 to 15 years, selling it off and live on the large sum of money in millions? Uh, what's wrong with that? You won't be free for 10 to 15 years. If you're lucky, you say 10 to 15, it could be 20, 25 years, but what's wrong with that? You won't be free. You will be completely unfree for 10, 15, 20 years. That business will own you. Now, like I said earlier with the guys who don't mind drama, if your immediate response to that is, well, I don't care. I'll take no freedom for a hundred million dollars. Then great. Go do that. That's fine. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. And I've had people offer me money. I've had guys offer to hire me. I'm in a consultant. I've had guys big guys offer me some big amounts of money. Say, you, you're going to come work for me. I'm going to, I'm going to run your life, but I'm going to pay you a mountain of money. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. My freedom is too important to me. Now, if your freedom, if money is more important to you than freedom or hundreds of millions or millions of dollars is more important to you than being free your whole life, then go ahead. Isn't this more efficient given that someone doesn't want to work their whole life? You are mixing up alpha 2.0 and traditional with model A versus model B. You can have an alpha male 2.0 business that is a model B-ish business. My marketing company, I can sell someday. I don't need to work my whole life in my marketing company. Now this, I do have to work. I'd have to work this or the money wouldn't come in. This business here, this alpha 2.0 company. But my marketing business, that doesn't need me. I could sell, that's an asset I could sell. And it's a pure alpha 2.0 business. So you can start a location independent alpha 2.0 business that doesn't require you to be there that becomes its own asset. You can do that. Uh, wouldn't an Alpha 2.0 business, sacri business sacrifice a lot of money if the model is capped at a $1 million per year income? It is not capped there. It is not capped there. Um, you can go to $1.5 million. $2 million would be tough. And so it's not capped. The way it would work is once you hit, you know, and it depends on the business, depends on the scenario, $1 to $2 million a year, you'd have to make a decision. Do I keep going after the big money and violate the Alpha 2.0 model or do I stick with the Alpha 2.0 model and stick with my and, and put a cap on my own income? So you can decide how much money you make. As a matter of fact, um, should I say this? I mean, yeah, at some point very soon, I'm going to have to make that decision. I'm going to have to make the decision. Do I want the big money and violate certain aspects of the Alpha 2.0 model? Not turn it into a traditional business. I will never own a traditional business. Kill me. But violate some p bits and pieces. For example, I was talking to some of my attorneys a while back. And I said, um, you know, if we get to this certain point and I have to hire an employee, I have to hire a salaried employee because I want to hit these big numbers. 
How can I do that in a way where it's location dependent, I don't pay a lot of taxes, and then done? How do I alleviate all those problems? And, and we had a few answers. So it's not capped. You just the model is capped, but you can go beyond that cap if you want. Um, wouldn't it be better to grow one large business even since even if it flops, the money you've earned would significantly outperform what you make? <clears throat> Say one million a year. Again, you wouldn't have any freedom during the time you were building that business if it was a traditional business. You would not be free. I want you to be free. Uh, last piece to his question. Wouldn't hiring employees have the advantage of stable performance over contractors? More short-term and unstable. Are you fucking kidding? Have you ever had employees? When employees quit, it's worse than when some contractors quit. So when, an, when you have soured employees and they leave, it's, it's a nightmare in the company. When I have people leave in my company who are contract workers, it's a minor inconvenience and then it's fine. So no, the benefits outweigh the, the, the advantages outweigh the disadvantages in my opinion. <coughs> um, you can also have stable performance over a long time with contractors. You can. It's possible. I've seen guys do it. So you're making a generalization. I understand what you're saying, but you're not, you're not taking into account the entire picture. And I'll say this again, dude. Based on your questions, if you want to sacrifice your freedom for 15 years and blow your brains out and have the business own you for 15 years and then sell it and make $50 million and then be free, go ahead. That is not the model I would ever follow. I want the money and the freedom. But if you don't mind, go ahead. It's fine. Water time. Hang on. <clears throat> Checking the camera. Good. I learned how to do the um, ISO and the white balance and some other shit on my camera. Hopefully the lighting is okay. See, this fucks it up when I put the mug in there. <laughs> All right. Which countries would you consider living in if you were an Alpha 2.0 that enjoys fucking hot white hookers <laughs> and wants to live in a place that will be reasonably economically stable with reasonable living costs for the next 20 years? There is no such country like that anywhere in the world, and there never will be. I'm sorry. You're looking for a fantasy land. There's no such thing as fantasy lands. There's no such thing as Disneyland. There's no such thing as paradise. Every country has some very good things about it and very terrible things about it. There is no country where you can fuck hot white hookers, and it's economically stable, and it's cheap. There's no such country. Um, the next 20 years. Yeah, I, You're fantasizing. Now... As close as you could get to that, you're not going to get that. But as close as you could get would be Southern South America. Argentina, Chile, Paraguay. The women down there are more or less white. Uh, economically stable? No. Reasonable living costs? Kind of. <clears throat> economically stable? No. Argentina? Pfft. No. Chile is more economically stable than Argentina, but they have darker skin in Chile. So, no. You're fantasizing... Instead, what you should do is something like five flags. You say, this country is my money country, and this country is where I live, or maybe this country is where I live, and this country is where I hook up with chicks. Perfect. Now you have the best of all worlds. That's what I'm doing. It's great. It's great. It's so fucking good. I can't wait for next year. All right. What are all the points to go over when giving the talk to the girl three months or so into the relationship? Three months is the minimum. Five months is better. Longer than five months is better, but three months is the minimum. Essentially, you are saying to her in the talk, I care about you. I love spending time with you. I look forward to being with you. And I am not a monogamous man. I will never be fully monogamous. And don't go into detail that you could say, that doesn't mean I'm fucking 12 different women, but I will never be 100% monogamous. That's not who I am. If that is a deal breaker for you, I completely understand and I will let you go. I will be sad if you go. I had to learn to throw that in there. Remember, I don't have a lot of empathy, so I had to throw that in there. You gotta say, I will be sad. Because if you just say, I will let you go, they'll say, you don't care if I leave you. So you gotta say, I will be sad if, you, if I let you go, but I'm will, I understand your feelings. I'm willing to let you go. That's the, that's the bottom line of the talk. By the way, when you say that to a woman, no other man in her entire life has ever said anything like that to her. What do men say to women they're dating? Please don't go. I'll do anything you want. You're saying, if you need to go, I understand. I won't like it, but I understand. Cool. What happens when she gets pissed off? She gets frustrated. What happens to her attraction? Awesome. 
I have had many scenarios where I did the talk and the women got more horny two or three days later when they came back because the attraction just goes, bam. What are you saying? I'm a valuable man and I don't need you. That's nothing but attraction, dude. What do you say to a woman or act when you say, I'll do whatever I can so you don't leave me? What happens to her attraction? <laughs> How would you cold approach from zero companies to get an Alpha 2.0 consulting business started when you don't have a portfolio yet? LinkedIn. Start with LinkedIn. That's the best place to start for consultants. It's fantastic. I wish I had LinkedIn back in the day. It's so good. Um, and you're honest with people. You are honest. You say, by the, don't say this right off the bat, but when you're really talking to them and they start asking you questions, which is a good sign, you say, I'll be honest with you. I've never done this before. I'm new at this. What I have done is ba -ba 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 -ba, other things you've accomplished for your prior employers. And what my skill sets are is ba -ba -ba -ba, so I'm willing to charge you much less money and be very flexible on the price because I'm new. And you just be honest with them. Come clean. You're doing it. That's you start. What do you think about using minoxidil or similar products for hair slash beard growth? So I can't speak to beard growth. I've never really give a shit about that. Um, minoxidil is generally not worth it. At best, it will create peach fuzz. So you're going to get peach fuzz. You probably don't need peach fuzz. You probably want real hair. So um, minoxidil is only valid if you just are barely thinning and you're not thinning anymore. The problem with barely thinning is, wait five years, you're gonna be more thinning. That's just how this works. So uh, to me, it's not worth it. And yes, I used to do Rogaine back in the day before I got my hair fixed. Didn't do shit, but a lot of guys I've talked to, and a lot of science I've looked into, it basically is good at growing peach fuzz. You're not gonna get your thick, full hair back with minoxidil. <clears throat> what advice you give a guy who has no business experience at all, or has any idea what he could do in terms of an Alpha 2.0 business. I think you've mentioned in one of your articles that you could sit down with any guy. Oh, good. Good for you. Any guy, and because I did say this, any guy and ask him questions and then be able to give him some good ideas. Yes. Any of you fuckers who says, but I'm not good at anything and I have no business skills and no one would pay me to do anything. I could sit down with you. I'm not going to do this, but I could. I could sit down with you with a clipboard, interview you, drill the fuck out of you for an hour and a half, and I would come up with at least two things you could do right now to make a six-figure income, not the 75,000 Alpha 2.0, 100,000 years, $100,000 a year. You can do it. So what exactly would those questions be that you would ask a guy that has no clue what he could do in terms of starting a business? It would take an hour and a half, so I can't do that here. Generally, it would be, what have you done in the past? What have you done in past jobs? Well, I did this. What did that accomplish for your employer? Number one. Number two, what are you good at? What are you naturally good at? What do you have a natural talent for? Number three, what are your hobbies? From your hobbies, you can derive things. I started the Black Dragon blog back in 2009 as a hobby. Just to make my goal back then, sounds funny now, my goal back then was to make $300 a month to pay for the gas and the, and the drinks I was buying on women on first, first dates back then. That was it, because my hobby was dating chicks back then. So I would start with those three questions. And yes, I could. I could pull out at least two things you could do as a consultant or coach or some kind of advisor that would make a six a low six-figure income. What are your ultimate life, money, and woman goals now that you're getting closer to age 50? And how are they different from the long-term goals you had in your 20s or 30s? Um, they're radically different. Um, um, boy, that's a big question. Uh, I, could, I could go for 20 minutes on that. So... In my case, I have exceeded all the goals I had in my 20s and 30s. So I, in terms of my income, not my net worth, but my income, I make not only more than I ever set a goal for, multiples of what I set. My biggest income goals, I make more than double that now. I make a lot more money than I ever planned. As I mentioned earlier in this AMA, my sex life on a scale of 1 to 10 is an 11. It is beyond my wildest fantasies. Far beyond my goals, I have my goals... Then I had my wildest fantasies, and now this is today. It's ridiculous. So I've exceeded all these things. The only thing left in terms of that is my net worth. Uh, in my opinion, and this is just my subjective opinion, I think my net worth is lower than it should be based on my age, my income, my business history. So I have been scrambling, and I still am, to raise my income. I don't need to raise my income. I make plenty of money. But to raise my income so I can shovel more money into my net worth. And so when I hit 52, 53... When I hit the next phase of my mission, 
that will be the deciding factor, how much money I have socked away in terms of residual after-tax monthly income from my investments. So my big goal right now, two big goals, one is my net worth, the second one is to optimize my physical health. I want to become an athlete. I don't want to just lose weight. I want to become an athlete. And when you make that decision in your late 40s, it's, it's an interesting decision to make. But I'm serious about that. So I didn't have to worry about my physical fitness or health as I've talked about when I was in my 20s because you don't need to worry about that in your 20s, early 30s. As I've said many times, when you cross age 35, that's the demarcation you cross from younger to older man. And that's when the problems begin. Your body starts to fight you a little bit, certainly as you get into your 40s. So I've been, that's a really big goal I have. Those are the two big ones. Um, I have a lot of goals, but they kind of all add up to that, more or less. I could go on and on about that. That's a big topic for me, but that's the summary. Regarding your Alpha Male 2.0 business course, how can the exception of selling someone else's products, with the exception of selling someone else's products, excuse me, how can you implement the various business models you recommend in the course if you don't have any specialized knowledge or skills? Here we go again. You guys, all, you're full of your excuses. What if you're just really untalented? You're not. Would then be the other, would then the other business models just not be for guys in that particular situation? Two answers. Number one, you are full of shit. You are not untalented. You are not a big amoeba that just lays around all day with no brain. You're being stupid. When I say that with love, you have talents, you have a skill or two. Yes, you have that. That's the first answer. Second answer. You don't have to be a consultant or a coach. Sell products. Let's sell a service. Sell a service that someone else does. That's fine. I just talked to a guy last month. Let's see. Yeah, last month. He makes $40,000 a month net selling products on Amazon. He doesn't advise anybody. He doesn't have a blog. He doesn't do any consulting. He doesn't do any coaching. No one knows who he is. No one gives a fuck. He just sells products. So if you're one of these guys who are convinced incorrectly that you have no skills that anyone would pay you for, then fine, sell products. It's fine. No one's saying, I said in the Alpha Tupino business course, didn't I? You can sell products, services, or information. If you don't want to sell information and you don't want to sell services that involve advice, then sell products or sell a service that is not regarding advice. Okay, whatever. You can outsource the service too. Stop making excuses. Fucking hell. Do you have a rank order list of the most valuable finance resources, text, audiobooks, etc.? So not really. I've got a one shelf on one of my bookshelves is a the books that I consider core books that I go back to and reread or look things up in, and a lot of those are finance books. Um, but beyond that, no, I don't. It is on the to-do list when the new website is ready few more weeks, my new, new master blog, which is a com combination of all my blogs, to have a Alpha 2.0 reading list, recommended reading list. I'm going to get that done. So it's coming. The Unchained Man is bar none the most important resource for men to acquaint themselves with. Thank you very much. Do you still plan to author a sequel to this, <clears throat> as you alluded to in the Unchained Man addendum style podcast? So here's the challenge with that. The Unchained Man is the most important book I have ever read, excuse me, wrote, excuse me, wrote, written. It is the most important book I've ever written. It is probably the most important book I will ever write. And so it took me two and a half years to write that book. Whereas a normal book, like a Black Dragon book or Big Income from Little Work, a business book, those are technical books. Even dating advice is a technical process. Do this, 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 then this. The Alpha Male 2.0 Unchained Man is more comprehensive than that. So it's a bigger deal. So if I were to write a sequel to that book, it would have to be amazing, beyond amazing, because that book is beyond amazing, in my humble opinion. Obviously, I'm biased. Um, so do I think I have it in me right now, at this point in my life right now, to write a book that is beyond amazing? The answer is no. My energies are in other places right now, so I don't think I could do that. Could I do that in a few years? Maybe. I don't know. I am much more likely to write addendums or add-ons to that book. For example, one of the things I have in my head is the unchained man, the unchained older man, or the unchained younger man. 
I certainly am going to do the Unchained Chinese Man. Definitely going to do that. So variations on the Alpha 2.0 Unchained Man. Sequel, I don't know. I would like to, but just because I'd like to do something doesn't mean it'd be a good idea. That book would have to be extraordinary. It's kind of like you have a great movie and they come out with a sequel and the sequel kind of sucks or it's like, it's okay. And when that happens, it makes, it lessens the movie, the original movie. It makes it less, in my opinion. I don't want to do that to that book. So that's the quandary I've got. We'll see. In asserting, hang on, what are we doing on time? We're doing good. In asserting that a prox, hang on, I need a drink. I need a drink. A drink of water. <laughs> Reverse osmosis water is the best water you can drink. In asserting that approximately 70% of males are beta, 25% are alpha 1.0, and 5% are alpha 2.0. Yes, that is my assertion. That is my educated guess. I could be off, but I think I'm reasonably close. In the modern era, that is. Is that in your estimation describing how these subpopulations of men actually live or how they conduct themselves behaviorally? For example, I imagine that indeed 5% of men exude outcome independence, but far less than 5% of men are actually earning a location independent income, more than $75,000 a year, and laying more than one female they deem at least cute concurrently. So good point, correct. So when I say that 5%, that doesn't mean there are alpha male 2.0s who've never read my material, don't even know who I am, right? So they would not adhere to the alpha male 2.0 standards, but these 5%, if you were to explain this to them, if you were just to summarize this, they go, oh yeah, done, let's do it. Instead of the alpha male 1.0 go, what, 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 what? Or the beta male say, well, I'm too scared, I don't know, what if it doesn't work? That's the difference. So yes, I'm describing um, how they conduct themselves behaviorally more than how they live. Now, just because... An alpha male 2.0 who doesn't have exposure to this material doesn't, just because he hasn't done it doesn't mean he hasn't done all that stuff. So for example, he may have a location independent income, but maybe it's 60,000 a year. Um, he may have a non-monogamous relationship, but maybe it's been three or four months since he's had sex with one of his FBs. You see him saying, he'll have something very similar to this already. He will, unless he's very young. If he's 18, 19 years old, he hasn't had time to develop these models yet. But if he's, you know, 30s, 40s, he has at least some of these lifestyle aspects already in place, most likely. I've met guys like this. So yeah, good question. How would you recommend following other than yourself regarding... How would you recommend following other than yourself regarding effective sales advertising and setting up a consulting business from zero? I don't understand your question and it's also too general a question. Uh, my standard stuff. Come up with a, find a niche. If you're not sure, then guess. Try to find what that niche's biggest problem is or one of their biggest needs. Develop a consulting service that satisfies, that fixes or alleviates that problem or satisfies that need and start contacting people on LinkedIn. To be very, very general. Isn't LMS the most important factor when it comes to getting eights, nines, and tens? What the fuck is LMS? Do you mean SMV? In other words, should I build my SMV? Oh, here we go. Should I build my SMV first before hitting on really attractive girls? I've already kind of mentioned that already in this AMA. When I was hitting on really attractive girls and having sex with really attractive girls starting in 2007, I was a divorced beta male dad. I was overweight. I had thinning hair. I drove an eight-year-old car. I lived in an apartment that didn't have a bed. Um, my SMV sucked. I was in the middle of a divorce and all my money was going to that. So I'd had no spending money and it worked out fine for me. No, I could do a big rant about this and I won't. I've talked about this already. I personally know guys who have no money, who are, don't have big muscles, who are virtually homeless, who have sex with hot girls, not girls, hot girls, eights and nines. I personally know these people. I have seen guys on YouTube who have ripped, ripped six-pack abs. They're buff. They look like Schwarzenegger, and they've never kissed a girl. They're crying into the camera about it. If it was all about SMV, how do you explain those people? It's not all about SMV. Now, is SMV a factor? Yes. Is it a big factor? Yes. Does it help a lot? Fuck yes. Is it all there is? No. You can be a low SMV guy 
and be confident, outcome independent, and have some level of dating skill and have sex with eights and nines. Tens, maybe, maybe not, depends on the city. Tens really is a regional thing. If you live in Los Angeles and you don't have a lot of SMV, fucking tens is going to be pretty tough. Yes. But if you live in, you know, wherever, some random city, Kansas City, Denver, Denver, Colorado, you know, Minneapolis, yes, you can fuck even tens. Yes, yes, you can. It's not easy, but you can. Yes. So no, start now. The dumbest thing men do, and the internet poisons men in this, the dumbest thing men do is say things like, I have to buy a Lamborghini before I can hit on hot girls. You're a moron. I have to get six-pack abs before I hit on hot girls. Do you think I have six-pack abs? No. I drive a, well, I don't drive a piece of shit anymore. I drive a Lexus, um, $40,000 car. It's a nice car. Um, but before that, I was driving a Nissan Maxima, 8, 9, 10 years old. It's a piece of shit. It sucked. It wasn't cool. For most of the time that I was doing hardcore Black Dragon in my little bullshit little house in a lower middle class neighborhood where um, the grass was three feet tall, I had no decorations, I had hand-me-down furniture, women would walk into that house and go, did you just move here or something? I'm like, no, I've been here three years. There's nothing on the walls, one little tiny shitty couch I got from my mom in the middle of the living room and nothing else. It looked like a serial killer lived there. Didn't have a problem. Had sex with a lot of hot girls. Still do. <clears throat> How to reach out to an ex-friend with benefits to restart the relationship after a long time of no contact that came about when you moved away. The same, same deal. If it's been more than six months, just send her a text. Hey, how's it going? How's life? My favorite text to send when I do that is, hey, how's life? Sometimes you have to say, hey, in your name. Hey, it's Caleb. How's life? Because if she's deleted your number, that's it. And start there. And there's no special technique to that. Just do it. Don't try to regame her. Just be friendly. Would you say, checking the camera here, would you say being a self-employed but location dependent is at least a little better than being an employee? Um, yes, I would say that. It's still horrible, but it is less horrible, yes, to be a self-employed location dependent guy than being an employee, yes. Anything's better than being an employee, dude. So yes. Is it still something I'd recommend? No. That'd be terrible. I would kill myself if I had a location-dependent business. Oh, man. Shoot myself in the head, man. In Germany, where I live, you can be self-employed and work as a physiotherapist. Here we are again. Are you the same guy who was asking this earlier? For public health insurance, a.k.a. government pays you for treating patients. Number one, you're location-dependent. Unacceptable in my world. Number two, you require a degree to do your work, and you're not a doctor. Also unacceptable in my world. I would never do that. Ever, ever, never, ever. Which, if any, of the six societal values have you found yourself at odds with in the past 20 years and today? So for those of you who don't know, the six societal values are from the Unchained Man. They are the six things that society shows you and teaches you to give a shit about when you actually shouldn't give a shit about them. They are, let's see, conformity, security, control over others, emotional validation, drama, social validation, and not being alone. Those six things. So those six things, what have I found myself at odds against? Um, well, I'll tell you the ones that didn't matter to me at all. Not being alone, didn't give a shit about that. I love being alone. Social validation, I don't give a shit about people think about me. I never had a problem with that. Emotional validation, I hate drama. So I had no problem with that one. Uh, control over others, yeah, I don't really, not a big deal for me. Um, security was a thing. Financial security was something I had to work on. Uh, internal security, so that would probably be the, that'd probably be it. Conformity a little bit in, in my 20s when I was a young man. When you're a young guy, you're much more sensitive about what people think about you than when you're older. Younger men tend to be more outcome dependent. So I had some of that in my 20s. A um, little bit in my early, early 30s. Grew out of it 35 when I made that transition at 2.0. I made my transition alpha male 2.0 when I was 35. So I would say conformity a little bit and security would be the ones that I had to work on the most. The other, um, the other ones, not, not so much. What is your current hierarchy of the SLA? The SLA, again, from the Unchained Man, this is the seven life areas. Every, every way in which you spend your time falls in one of these seven areas. What is your current hierarchy in descending order of the SLA in importance to you at this time and your time, and is your time and devotion to each congruent with that rank order? So let's do it, easy. Number one, top list, financial. Boom, 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 always. That is always the case with me. Financial, 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 number one. That's business, investing, all that stuff. 
Number two for me now is physical, which is a change. It used to be women, now it's physical. As I'm older, physical, number two. Number three is my woman life, definitely, because pink fireflies in there. <sighs> number four would be recreational. Uh, no, no, that's not true. I would say spiritual is probably one notch above recreation. Spiritual is slowly starting to move up for me. It's still down at number four, but it's a little more important to me now than it was when I was in my 20s. Let's see. Then it would be recreational, number five, when I take time off. Family would probably be number six um, because my kids have moved out and my parents are old and they've moved far away. They got divorced two years ago in their 70s because monogamy doesn't work. So I don't really have a family I don't consider Pink Firefly part of my family. That's more part of my woman life. So family used to be very important. Now it's not so much because my kids have grown up and gone away. And my parents, you know, my parents are in their 80s. So my parents aren't going to be around much longer. I mean, in terms of long term, you know what I'm saying? So family's not a big deal for me anymore. Um, I'm not having any more kids, if you're wondering. Um, so last one is social, which I just don't give a shit about. Never have. And does my time, is it congruent with that rank order? Absolutely. That is what I do well. I am a very congruent person. I walk my talk. Everything I just listed is exactly how I spend my time. Financial, physical, woman, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Which of the SLA do preparatory tasks fall under, i.e. grocery shopping, laundry, household cleanup, etc.? Well, it depends on why you're going grocery shopping. So grocery shopping would be your physical life because that's eating. So it's part of your physical life when you go grocery shopping. Laundry... If you want to get into the weeds about this, it depends. If you're doing laundry, look good for a date, that's your woman life, right? So it depends on the areas in which. Household cleanup depends on why you're cleaning your house. So I clean my house to be more effective at my work because I work out of my home. So to me, that's in my financial life. If you're cleaning your house because you're expecting company over and you want to look good for them, that'd be your social life. If you're cleaning up your kitchen because some hot chicks come over to your house, That'd be your woman life. So it depends on why you're doing that. I wouldn't focus overly on this stuff, but that's how that works. How many components are there to your personal code of conduct, i.e. never promising monogamy would constitute one component and so on? There's about, I'm not going to give you the list because it's kind of private, but there's about six, five, six. You don't want a lot of items on your code because your code limits your actions. So you want to be careful with that. The basic ones for me, I mean, you probably know most of them. I will never be monogamous. I can't lie. I can be sarcastic. I can avoid answering questions. I am a wizard at not answering questions. So I don't have to, I don't have to disclose things, but I can't lie. If I say something it has to be the truth or I can't say it. Things like that, I don't have very many. When you formulate your code, you don't want a lot of things on there. You don't want 27 things on your code. That's not a good idea. All right. What are your thoughts on the Tates brothers? Are they alpha male 2.0? I know who you're talking about, but I don't know them well enough to answer that question. I know who you're, I know you're referring to, but I don't know them well enough to know if they're 2.0 or not. Don't know. As a 21-year-old, I find it very hard to define a life mission, what kind of work I should be doing to arrive at this conclusion, just experiencing more, trying lots of different activities. Okay, so I have started saying in the last year or two, if you're under the age of 30 and you're having trouble formulating your mission, don't worry about it. Just skip it. Wait till you're 30 and then focus on it. Instead of a mission, focus on long-term goals. What are your long-term goals? What are your things you want in your life three to five years from now or so? Focus on that first. Revisit your mission when you hit age 30. Now, if you're in your 30s, no excuses for you. You need to figure out your mission. Critical. So don't, you're 21. Don't worry about it. If you've done work on it, you can't figure it out. I didn't have a mission when I was 21. I think that's too much to ask of guys in their early 20s, even mid-20s, to ask them what their life mission is. You're not done growing, and your brain isn't even formed fully until you're 25. Your brain forms from the back to the front, and so this isn't fully formed yet for you. You're 21, you gotta wait you're 25. So to ask you now to do a mission, it's kind of unfair. So don't worry about a mission right now if you're in your 20s. If you've tried, if you've tried to figure it out, you get nowhere, don't worry about it. Put it on the schedule for when you are 30. And if you wanna be a nerd like me, I did this, I've done this, I do this now. I have a spreadsheet of shows at what the year will be at certain ages. So figure out what year that will be for you. So 21, 2029, right? That's when you'll be 30. So 2029, that's when you need to figure out your mission. How to manage, maintain FBs in different locations when you travel a lot and can't see them for weeks, months at a time. Okay, a few things. So this is a big technique. I have more to say about this later because I'm doing this myself. Number one, you need multiple women in the... Well, wait, first, let me back up. 
It depends on when that, how often you revisit those locations. So if it's a random place and you don't know if you'll be there ever again, this is kind of irrelevant, right? But if it's a place you're regularly gonna visit in every given year, you need multiple FBs there. You can't have just one. You want at least three. Because that way if you have some attrition, you have someone else left there, number one. Number two, you need to maintain some kind of contact while you're gone. So if you're gonna be gone, let's say for six months, every two to three months, pick up your WhatsApp and hit them up and just have a nice conversation with them. Send them some pictures, not nude pictures, but you know what I'm saying. Maintain that contact. Ask her how she's going, get a feel for her relationship status. Maintain that link every month or two or three, depending on how long you're gonna be gone. Start with those two, those two things, lots of numbers, multi, three, at least three per country you're gonna revisit and maintain the link. Don't just go months and months with no contact, then she's gone. That's a big topic, I'll have much more to say about that uh, later. Okay, I just had a little break. My voice is going. <laughs> We're about 70% into the questions, so I will continue. If I pass out, then just call the ambulance. No, I'm fine. <clears throat> you know, my laptop battery is getting low. Make sure that's okay. Oh, no, we're good. I think. Yeah, we're good. All right. Uh, where are we here? Jesus Christ. All these questions. Hang on a second. You guys are very inquisitive, but I guess that's a good thing. Take it as a compliment. As you gather international feedback on your dating techniques, <clears throat> do you have any observations regarding their or particular components Efficiency dependent on specific countries, nations, cultures. <clears throat> um, well, yes. Also, what's the worldwide coverage of men providing any feedback? Thanks. So I've got guys in the Alpha Tupano community. I've got guys in every region of the world minus Africa. I've had a few guys say that they're Africans, but not very many. A few blog readers but in terms of guys actually going out and dating and get results, I'm not, I haven't heard of any Africans as of yet. Um, that might not be true. Maybe I did hear from one or two guys in South Africa. So uh, obviously United States, Canada, yes. Mexico, definitely yes. South America, absolutely. Most of Asia, absolutely. Russia, yes. Uh, Europe, of course. Um, Middle East, some, some in the Middle East. The more, you know, non-extreme areas of the Middle East, like Bahrain, UAE, places like that. Um, Australia, New Zealand, of course. Uh, so everywhere in the world, minus maybe Africa. And in terms of um, <clears throat> observations regarding efficiency, to so that's a very difficult question to answer generally. <clears throat> generally speaking, the dating aspect is more or less the same. The only difference there is there are liberal cultures like Brazil and there are more conservative cultures like Taiwan and India. So is it harder to get laid in Taiwan than Brazil? Yes, of course. But can you get laid in Taiwan? Of course, there are guys getting laid in Taiwan. So you have that aspect. The other aspect that changes a lot internationally is the amount of drama that guys put up with. So if you live in South America, if you live in Southern Europe, you're gonna get a lot more drama from your women than if you live in Scandinavia, Canada, <laughs> you know, Japan, right? So there are high drama cultures and there are lower drama cultures. So that would be the difference in relationships. Um, barring that, I mean, that's the best way I could summarize the answer to that question. That's a big answer. And at some point, I'm gonna have to write up some kind of big comprehensive study of various countries, various regions, and the difference in dating dynamics and relationship dynamics. That'll be down the road, but that's on the, the distant to-do list. But anyway, yeah. It really is interesting to hear from guys all over the world on their experiences. I really enjoy that. And I've had experiences. I've dated women all over the world, and I've certainly had big differences. I mean, you guys who are international, you know the difference. Having sex with a white girl in America is one thing. Having sex with a Latin woman in South America is a whole different thing. Holy shit. Hell to the yes, it's a whole different scenario, isn't it? And then you have sex with like a woman in Japan or China. It's a whole different thing, right? I guess I'm talking about sexual differences, not dating differences, but that's a subset. Anyway. <clears throat> okay, how do you test out your sales pages? I'm guessing split testing is a good way, yes. 
but just write up, wrote up longer, more traditional story based sales page, not normally my style. I don't care what your style is. You shouldn't care what your style is. You should only care about what works. Long form sales pages work better than short form sales pages. Long form sales letters and direct mail out pull short form sales letters. So I don't care what your style is. You need to do what works. There are things I do in my advertising world that are not my style, but I fucking do them because they work and they make me money. So you can't be picky about this shit. Do what works. Before going live, I want to make sure it isn't rubbish. Here we go again. This seems to be the recurring theme for this AMA. I don't want to do anything wrong before I start my business. I have to do everything perfect. Even if it takes 17 years. Get into the game. Start your business. Do it wrong. Fuck. Do you get a few customers to read it over and get feedback first or hire a copywriter to check or something like that? So yes, you can do those things and then get to work. Do those things, take two or three weeks and do those things and then publish the page and get to fucking work and start to make sales. And you can split test or test. Now, what you do on split test, well, let me jump ahead. The point is, yes, you can do those things two or three weeks. That's it. That's it. That's it. If you've been stressing out about this for more than two or three weeks, you're doing this wrong. Two or three weeks and then go ahead and publish it. But it might be rubbish. It might be rubbish. It might be shit. You might lose money. Oh my God, you might lose 300 bucks. Oh my God. Yes, that's part of being an entrepreneur. You might lose. And then you course correct. And then you course correct again. And then you'll start making money. That's how this works. So don't stress too much about this. Um, in terms of testing my sales, sales pages, over the course of my business history on the, on the internet, I have done everything. I've tested everything. Um, I need to do it again because I have a new slew of sales pages now, so I'm not testing everything right now. But yes, A-B split testing. You want to test headlines. You want to test offers. You want to test prices. All three of those things. Generally in that order, although not, not necessarily. Um, but you can't test this shit unless you publish the page and start selling stuff. Start your business. Don't be afraid to make mistakes and do it wrong. Too many of you guys are way too worried about this. Get into the game. Start your fucking business. Do shit wrong. Lose money. That's normal. <coughs> the reason for that... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Damn, hang on a second. <coughs> the reason you guys have this mindset is you're coming from an employee mindset. And a go to college, go to school mindset where you better do it right. You'll get a bad issue. You'll get a bad mark on your report card. Your dad will be pissed. That's not how business works. You do it 80% good, 80%. And you have to guess the last 20%. And you get in there and you might be wrong and that's okay. You course correct, you course correct, and then you make money. That's how it works. <clears throat> God damn. Relating to people. Can you talk about relating to people and improving this skill? Women, men in personal life or social life, it is different. Is it different in personal life versus business and relationships? Um, I don't really know what you mean by your question. Um, I don't relate to people. I communicate with people. Um, I don't have a lot of empathy. I'm an INTJ, so I'm low on the empathetic scale. So I don't do a lot of relating. And I'm also highly outcome independent. So now I don't give a shit about how you feel. But, but, but I have very strong communication skills. So I don't view it as relating to people. I view it as communicating with people. On dates, I have to communicate with women in a way where I get from zero to sex as quickly as possible. In relationships, I have to communicate with women in a way where they want to stay with me in a low drama way, even though they know I'm having sex with other women. And when they leave me, not if, but when they leave, they have a 94% chance of returning back to me. So I have to communicate that way, <clears throat> including my relationship with Pink Firefly. I've had to work a lot on my communication skills with her because she's so different and we live together been several years now, but anyway, in business, I have to communicate with my clients, communicate with my customers. Right now, I'm communicating with you, right? So I have strong communication skills that I've worked on over a long, long, long period of time, but I don't consider it relating to people. I consider it communication skills. This AMA you're doing, is it improving your relationship with a new younger audience or a broad strategy of marketing and sales? Both. This is both. I am doing this for all these reasons. Number one, yes, getting a deeper relationship with my audience. That's number one. Number two, I expect this fucking video or videos to get shares and clicks and traffic and engagement and clips of it. And yes, I expect that too. And that would be marketing and branding. So it's both. If it wasn't both, I wouldn't do this. It takes too long. <laughs> um, 
Why am I getting duplicate questions here? Hang on a sec. <clears throat> primary niche versus sub niche versus market. Your primary niche is men who need dating and women help? No, my primary niche is not that. That is a need of the people in my niche. But your sub niche market is, is to make money, alpha 2.0 business. Uh, not exactly. But you talk about multiple countries, financing is, my, finances, investing. There are other guys just teaching five flag countries versus some only teaching investing and finances. Yes, I, I think I see what you're saying. Could you clarify in primary niche versus sub niches, like how you cover a lot versus others into one niche? Clarity or differences such as multiple markets, niches. Okay, so my niche is speaking generally. Can you speak generally about a niche? Unmarried men age 25 to 45. It is my understanding that, no, excuse me, that's not the entire niche. Unmarried men, 25 to 45, who don't require monogamy, who have a high need for freedom. That's the Alpha 2.0 niche. It has come to my attention through a lot of my uh, social media advertising data that most of that niche is actually men 25 to 35, younger guys. Now, I have plenty of guys in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s who follow my stuff too. But the niche that I need to focus on is the 25 to 45 demographic. So within that niche, I teach an alpha male 2.0 lifestyle, which is a more comprehensive lifestyle, which covers sex, yes, and entrepreneurship, both a very particular kind. Uh, I talk now, is that a broader offering? Yes. So it's a narrow niche, but a broader offering. So my offering is a little more broad. And in 2014, I had to make a decision and it was kind of a gamble on my part. And I decided to combine my black dragon dating stuff with my entrepreneurship, business, consulting stuff into one model called Alpha Male 2.0. And luckily it worked. It could have blown up in my face. And I was worried about making that offering too broad. I worried about that. I fretted about that for a while, but I went ahead and did it because I wanted to teach a lifestyle, not just how to get laid, which is not a lifestyle, or how to make money, which is horseshit. That doesn't mean anything. So uh, I don't know if I've answered your questions, but within, so within that lifestyle, you have five flags, international, you have all that stuff, correct. So that's why I have to be very careful about things, about not talking about certain things. For example, I don't talk about fitness. I shouldn't talk about fitness, okay? This is not my area. I don't talk about how to find friends, social skills. I don't really talk about that. So I have to make sure to not talk about certain things. Make sense? Um, but to get very good at and burrow down into the things that I am talking about. For example, on my blogs, I'm no longer gonna talk about politics, philosophy, movies, pop culture shit, that's fun to talk about, but that is not 100% congruent to the messaging of my niche. So I have to narrow back down to that message. That's why I'm getting rid of that information. Make sense? So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but that's my answer. <clears throat> Any suggestions on improving entertaining skills, personality, as with around women, instead of being a robotic tech guy? <laughs> you should not focus on entertaining women. That is the incorrect focus. That is PUA night game shit, which I don't teach. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm saying that I don't teach that. It's not part of the model. Instead, you need to focus on being interested rather than interesting. A woman will fuck you if you are interested in her and you're doing only 20% of the talking and asking a lot of questions and she's doing most of the talking. Then you'll get late. If you're trying to be cool and act like a clown or act like a cool guy or a tough guy or a rich guy or whatever guy you fantasize, a James Bond guy, you're probably not going to get late. Don't focus on being entertaining. Focus on being interested, using interpersonal skills, communication skills, and drawing her out. As I've talked about a billion times in my blogs, on first dates and second dates too, she should be doing 80% of the talking. That means you're not focused on you, you're focused on her. And then you'll get laid. <clears throat> I have a question about your business model. Why do you sell... Why do you only sell your products during a very small window of time? It seems you're leaving money on the table, particularly if an existing customer wants to buy an additional product. Okay, so here's what I do. What you're talking about is something I did two or three years ago. What I do now is I, I will release a new course. I will It will only be available for a short period of time. Then it will no longer be available. Then several months later, I will dramatically raise the price. I will remove some content. I might update little bits of the content and then I will re-release it under the higher price with less content to be fair to the guys who bought it originally. And then it's available year round. That's what I do now. <clears throat> now that means that if there's a certain thing where it's between the release period and the re-release period and you don't, you can't get it, just wait a little bit and then you can get it. For instance, I purchased the Alpha 2.0 course 
but I didn't notice the upsell or additional videos for older men. I realized this was something that I could like to have. I contacted customer support and they basically told me to take a hike. My, my staff did not tell you to take a hike. My staff, I'm sure, did not say anything like take a hike. If anything, my staff is too nice. So you are overstating it. I'm sure they didn't say that. If you show me the, the email they sent you, they did not, they were not mean to you. So come on, dude. <clears throat> By the way, uh, I'm not sure why you would want to take away a pay, why you would turn away a paying customer, particularly an existing customer that you've worked hard, spent a lot of money to acquire. The older man course that you are now talking about is as of this weekend, as of right now when I record this, is available. It's part of the Maximum Freedom course, Alpha Male 2.0 for the older man. See, it's available again. You just wait a little bit and then it's available. So you nothing to worry about. When outsourcing in the USA, I check unfamiliar suppliers have good, better business bureau rating. <clears throat> would What would a similar trustworthy rating source be internationally? Would Clutch.co be a good alternative BBB for vetting overseas suppliers? You know what? I, I, I don't know enough about Clutch to answer that question. Um, I don't have an easy answer to that question. I just don't. I wish there was. And frankly... Um, well, there's a, a few things I could say that I won't, but there's no easy answer to that question. It really depends on the country. I can't give you a, a global thing. Like anywhere in the world, just check with this website and see if there, there's no way to do that. <clears throat> At what point will my blog start attracting others asking to do guest posts on my site? 18 months or so, depending on how hard, hard, hard you work. I mean, blogging is a slow game. It's a slow burn. You gotta be very patient. How many pages would I need to have and what domain authority ranking would I need to make money? It's not about authority domain ranking. It's about daily views and whether or not you are actually selling something on the website or you're monetizing it through ads. I talked about that in the How to Monetize a Blog webinar. It's not really about that. What proportion of articles should be top 10 lists and what proportion should be reviews? There is no formula for that, dude. I don't have top 10 lists. Do I have top 10 lists? I mean, I think I've done a few years ago and I did just fine. So it could be 0%. You need to write high quality content geared toward your very narrow niche that helps your very narrow niche solve a problem or fulfill a need. Then the details don't really matter. There are some formulas that I've talked about where you have um, answer, SEO answer, question posts, deep dive posts, things like that, but don't get hung up on these specific numbers. That's not how it works. How many, the same guy, how many words should blog posts typically be? Again, you're way too hung up on the specifics. You've got blogs like Seth Godin blog where he has blog posts every day. Sometimes it's one paragraph per blog post. You've got blogs like Mark Manson where it's like 14 pages long. It's whatever you want, whatever works best for your niche. In my affiliate marketing website, should I focus on content directly about my niche? Yes. Or content on other subjects that would attract the kind of people who would also be interested in my niche? No. Content specifically for your niche and nothing else. With rare exception. Should I structure my agency brief for requesting proposals to outsource my content marketing? How should I structure my agency brief for requesting proposals to just go on Upwork.com and just set up a project and, and, do, and, and wait and you'll get the proposals and pick who you want. It's awesome. Does my blog name have to, have to be called blog for good SEO? No. Or can it name it journal or something else? Yes. Just to set it apart from that. Sure. You can name your blog anything you want. What are your thoughts on The Hoth and Outreach Mama for help with content development, link building, SEO, blah, blah, blah. I don't know what those websites are. Recommendation for agencies on the Philipp in the Philippines that research and write articles that are, dude, I don't know these things. You're, you're being way too specific. How would I know that what good companies are there in the Philippines? Upwork.com is all you need. And, and that, that includes the entire world, including the Philippines. Two more questions for this guy. He's, he's really worked up about his blog. How to make sure an SEO provider uses only white hat technique techniques, no black hat techniques, and no private blog. Dude, you shouldn't give a fuck. You're, you're way overdoing this. Start writing some fucking articles. Worry about SEO later. You have to worry about it, but not now. Just get to work. Don't worry about this nitpick shit. You're, you're really worked up. You gotta you take a deep breath. Do some meditation. Last question from me. How are... Outsource professional content writers going to be going to be able to write truthfully and authentically about products on my site when they have not even tried out those products. Well, I wouldn't do that. I would ship them the products. I wouldn't do that. 
I want to, I don't want to lie. Remember, I'm on, part of my code is I can't lie. So I wouldn't do that. I would ship them the products and say, here's the product, write an article about it. Particularly niched food products. Same thing, ship it to them. I wouldn't do that. All right, moving on. Any advice for someone with persistent RSI? RSI, strain injury, got it. But would also want to get started on an Alpha 2.0 business. You have chronic pain. What does that have to do with starting an Alpha 2.0 business, a location independent you can run for your house? Nothing to do with it. Work when you can work. Don't work when you can't. I don't know how serious it is. I mean, if you're literally bedridden for X amount of hours per day, work for a few hours a day and then go to bed. Uh, it's an Alpha 2.0 business. So all you need is a keyboard to be able to do this. How much strain is that? I mean, you know, not a big deal. Um, let's see. How long after birth should I wait before trying to meet and have sex again with an FB or MLTR due to their new baby NRE? So to clarify, new baby NRE only applies if she's with the man who fathered the baby. Okay, so if it's a random hookup or an ex-boyfriend and she has the baby, there is no new baby NRE. You can go right in there. I've had sex with women who are eight months pregnant. I've had sex with women uh, within a month of having the baby. It's fine. Who cares? Now, if she's with the guy, if they're living together or really serious together, raising the baby together, that's new baby NRE. You need to give her some time. I would give her maybe a year. <clears throat> Clarifications. I read that women who are breastfeeding have their baby. I read that women who are breastfeeding have their... I can't read. I read that women who are breastfeeding their baby have lower sex drive due to or a hormonal mechanism involved in the production of milk. I have read that too. I don't know how much of a difference that makes in, in the real world. <clears throat> I wouldn't base my decisions of whether or not to fuck a woman whether or not she was breastfeeding. I wouldn't even consider that a, a, a factor. Broadening on that point, how long do you think women have some kind of baby NRE when they're obsessed with their baby and quote, aren't interested in men? I have never seen that to be the case. I think that is a lot of internet horse shit. I have never seen women have a baby and suddenly they turn off sex. I have never seen that. I'm sure it's happened somewhere. I've literally never seen that. I just haven't. Women have their baby, their body needs to recover, and then they're right back to being a woman again and they're horny again and want to have sex again. I've just never seen what you're describing. But I have heard people talk about that. I've just never seen it. To clarify, my question is not in the context of me re reproducing with a woman, but more in the context of me having FBs or MLTRs with single women or women who are in an open relationship with a boyfriend or cheating on him and they get pregnant, not from me, give birth to their baby, etc. Yes, I understand. I've had many women, FBs, MLTRs, who had babies from other guys. I don't give a shit. My work's fine. How long should I wait? How long after birth should I wait before trying to meet and have sex again with an FB or MLTR? So what I said. So if she is not with the guy... Within four weeks. She, women really can't have sex within two or three weeks. Doctors say six weeks, although that's bullshit. Three, four weeks. I would say four weeks. Forget, give her body to recover and that's it. And you're good. If she's with the guy, I would say a year. Or whenever she breaks up with the guy, whichever comes first, the younger she is, the more likely she'll break up with him. What do you think of the don't ask, don't tell policy when it comes to relationships? In other words, a conventional GFBF situation or marriage where the woman understands that men will be men and that it's not going to be exclusive, but she does not want to know about the flings of an out of sight, out of mind kind of way. I think they're fine. So bottom line is anything is better than monogamy. Anything is less bad than monogamy. Now there are some things that are much less bad and some things that are a little less bad. So something that'd be a little less bad would be a threesome only relationship where the girl says you can fuck other women, but only when it's a threesome with me kill myself. Now, is that as bad as monogamy? No, pretty, but it's pretty bad. So that's in that gray area of, sure, it's better than monogamy, but the problem with that is long-term, would that be a healthy relationship? Because I know marriage is like this. Long-term, so the wife says, all right, my husband's a cheater. I'm just going to pretend he's not doing it, not think about it. Ugh. Fine for a while. Long-term, is that a really healthy relationship with quality communication? <laughs> you, it, no. I wouldn't want to have a relationship like that long term. Short term, sure. Long term, no. No. Pink Firefly and I communicate about everything. We're open about everything. We don't lie to each other. We don't hide things because that's more healthy. So I'm cool with it, but long term, I don't think it's a, a good model because I'm into long term consistent happiness. Long term, either for her or for him, but mainly for her, but for him too. 
Oh, here's the other thing too about those relationships. Men are fucking stupid. And men are very, as I've said before and shown on my blogs, men are really bad at not getting caught when they cheat. Men think they're really good at it and they're fucking terrible at not getting caught when they cheat. Women are ninjas when they cheat. Women are like CIA agents. They're amazing when they cheat on guys. When guys cheat on women, they're fucking morons. They almost want to get caught. I've talked about this before in my blogs. So what'll end up happening is he will cheat. He keeps cheating and he'll just really blow it. And one day there'll be a picture of him and his side girl on Instagram and it'll be plastered all over the world and the wife will be totally embarrassed and now we have an explosion. So that's another reason why that's not a good idea long-term, in my opinion. But it is better than monogamy, sure. Uh, let's see. I would appreciate some discussion on Sugar Daddy Game. It would be a good topic for your podcast. Uh, sure. That's not really a question. It's more of a suggestion, but sure. I have a lot more stuff coming for Sugar Daddy Game. I might write a book. So I have... Um, in the Ultimate Younger Woman Manual, I have two chapters on Sugar Daddy Game. I also will address it in the upcoming version of the Ultimate, the rewritten, re-updated Ultimate uh, Online Dating Manual. But it might make sense to have a separate book just for older guys with higher incomes for Sugar Daddy Game. I think that'll make a lot of sense. So I'll probably have to do that at some point. I have a feeling. All right. Last question. Is this the last question? I'm shocked. Holy fucking hell. Okay, this is the last question. My goodness. Hi there. Hi. If you have any, what are your thoughts about investing in or starting a business based in Singapore? So again, with the Argentinian guy, investing in and starting a business in are two very different things. There are places would be a great idea to start a business, but maybe not good to invest and vice versa. Okay, just be aware of that. Um, luckily, in either of those cases, Singapore, you're great. Singapore is fucking awesome. Singapore is best, one of the best places in the world. Now, Singapore is not growing. Singapore is at a pinnacle, but it's the pinnacle. So you're very safe starting a business there. Uh, you're reasonably safe investing there. If you want to invest more aggressively, you invest in somewhere that is not the pinnacle, that is the bottom and growing. That would be Southeast Asia, although Singapore is tight, kind of in Southeast Asia, isn't it? So you would be looking at countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, less so, but Places like that, because that you're going to get a higher return because these are countries that are low, but growing rapidly. Colombia is another really good one. Um, but investing in Singapore is fine. I mean, I have stuff in Singapore. No problem. I do business in Singapore. All good. Well, that's it. I hope this has been fun. Maybe I'll do this again. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see how this video does. We'll see how much traffic shares, likes, subscribes, all that good stuff this video or videos relate to and create. And if this video does very well, I will do another one of these. So you should like, share, subscribe, all the usual bullshit, YouTube bullshit, and or follow me on Instagram, that too, all that stuff. And if I see a lot of that activity, maybe I'll do another AMA. This was kind of fun. If not, I won't do this again. So the power is yours. Have fun. I'll see you guys in the next video.